This happened to me a few years ago, down in Arizona. I'd always been fascinated by the desert, the harsh beauty, the sense of vast, empty space. My name's Rowan, and I'm a freelance photographer. Back then, I was itching to get off the beaten track and capture something unique for my portfolio. So, I packed up my battered old jeep and headed south. I spent days exploring, finding remote, sun-bleached canyons and abandoned ghost towns. It felt good being out there alone. Just me and the camera in that quiet, empty landscape. I slept in the back of the jeep, ate canned beans and jerky, and didn't shower for longer than I care to admit. One afternoon about a week in, I was photographing the ruins of an old mining settlement, rusty machinery, crumbling adobe walls, all that stuff. I noticed a trail winding up into the hills behind the settlement and figured it might offer a better vantage point. The trail led into a narrow, twisting canyon. The sun was dipping lower in the sky, casting long shadows. I hesitated, knowing it probably wasn't smart to be out there alone as darkness fell. But hey, I was an idiot with a camera sometimes. Halfway up the canyon, I noticed a strange track pressed into the dry dirt. Huge, at least six inches wide. Not a boot or any animal I recognized. I looked closer and saw what looked like claw marks. My heart started to thump. Mountain lion? The prince continued, and now there was an odd, dragging mark alongside them. I'll admit it, I got spooked. I started backtracking out of the canyon, keeping an eye on the ridge above in case a mountain lion materialized. But as I scrambled back down to the trailhead I heard it, a rustling sound from inside the canyon, just out of sight. It wasn't the sleek movement of a cat. This was a lumbering, unsteady kind of noise. That familiar prickle of unease ran down my spine. I jogged the rest of the way down, my breath coming in uneven gasps. I reached my jeep, fumbled with the keys in my shaking hands, climbed in, and hit the gas. My rearview mirror showed the dusty trailhead and the mouth of the canyon bathed in the burnt orange light of the setting sun. Nothing moved, just silence. That night, I drove until I hit a highway and followed it until I found a grubby motel just off the exit. I parked around back where it was darker and cracked open a beer I had buried at the bottom of my cooler. As I sat there drinking, I tried to convince myself I was overreacting. Mountain lions were reclusive, almost never attacked humans. Those footprints? Probably just some deformed bear paw. I lay down on the lumpy motel bed, but sleep wouldn't come. Every time I drifted off, I'd snap awake, heart pounding, sure I could hear that rustling sound just outside the door. Morning brought some relief. I showered off the desert grit, packed up, and resolved to stick to more populated areas. But that feeling of being watched stayed with me. I kept glancing into my rearview mirror checking the road behind me. It was stupid, I knew, but I couldn't shake it. A few days later, I found myself further east, near the Mogollon Rim. It's a massive escarpment covered with dense pine forests, a world apart from the deserts I'd been driving through. I figured a change of scenery might do me good. I found a campground nestled within the forest and set about making some coffee. Late afternoon, I decided to hike a short scenic loop nearby. The trail meandered along the edge of the rim, offering breathtaking views of the canyons below. The air smelled of pine needles and the bird songs seemed amplified in the stillness of the forest. It felt good to be back among trees. The trail took me through a stand of tall, straight trunk pines. I noticed the ground in the shade was deeply rutted as if something very heavy had passed through repeatedly. Then, on one of the tree trunks, about chest high, 
I saw the gouges, deep, ragged scratches in the bark. My stomach dropped a little. Bear claws again, maybe? But these seemed unusually high, and the spacing between the marks felt wrong somehow. I turned to keep walking, and that's when I saw it. Only a glimpse, a flash of dark movement deeper in the trees. Large, upright. I couldn't make out details, only the impression of dark fur in a long, angular shape before it vanished behind a thicket. I knew then it was no mountain lion, no bear. I didn't know what the hell it was, only that the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up. I turned and sprinted the remaining distance back to the campground, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I tossed everything into my jeep and left the Mogollon Rim as fast as I could. I didn't stop again until I reached Phoenix and finally found a cheap hotel with a strong deadbolt on the door. I didn't see or hear anything else during my stay there. When I got back home, I spent hours scouring the internet for anything that seemed similar to what I'd seen. That's when I stumbled upon local forums, message boards with whispers about strange sightings, missing livestock, and the old stories of the dogmen. A supposed cryptid, upright and canine, something out of nightmares. The idea seemed insane, but as I read account after account, some even from that part of Arizona, I found myself remembering that lumbering gait, the unsettling height of the scratches on the tree, the tracks with their claw marks in the canyon. I'll never be certain it was a dogman. Maybe it was just a freakishly deformed bear or my mind playing tricks after too much isolation. One thing I know for sure, I'm never going back to Arizona. The photos from that trip are still buried somewhere on a hard drive at the back of my closet. The desert, the forests, they feel tainted to me now, no longer simply landscapes but the backdrop to something monstrous. I stick to cities these days, plenty of stuff to photograph without venturing into the shadows. I still find myself glancing over my shoulder sometimes, my eyes drawn to dark alleyways or the woods at the edge of the park. There's a part of me, a gnawing part, that knows I saw something uncanny out there. I just don't know what. I never want to find out. This happened to me a few years ago when I was living up in Oregon. I'm a contractor, name's Dalton, always on the lookout for new jobs, especially if they get me out into the wilds. I'm a nature buff at heart. Nothing beats the smell of pine trees and the quiet solitude of deep woods. A client had reached out with a project way out in the Siskiyou National Forest. An old fire lookout tower needed restoration. Sounded perfect for me, remote location, a bit of adventure, and decent pay. I loaded up my truck with tools, supplies for a few weeks, and headed out towards the California border. The drive took a couple of days, winding along old logging roads until I reached a dirt track that led up to the tower. It was a beauty, a three-story wooden structure with a wraparound balcony perched high up on a ridge overlooking miles and miles of densely forested mountains. The isolation was real, not another sign of civilization in sight. I spent the first week on the restoration work, replacing weathered timbers, repairing the old generator, and generally making it livable. It was peaceful, the most relaxed I'd felt in months. In the afternoons, I'd take breaks, sit out on the balcony with a beer, and just soak in the view. One evening, I decided to explore a bit further. There was a rough trail leading away from the tower and down the ridge. I followed it, the path snaking through thick stands of old-growth fir and cedar. About a mile in, I came across an abandoned logging camp, old machinery slowly rusting away in the undergrowth. It gave me that slightly eerie, forgotten feeling these places always do. 
I was turning to head back to the tower when I saw it a huge footprint in the soft soil of the trail. Now I know my animals, and this was no bear track. It was more upright, longer, almost human-like but way bigger, and the toes ended in what could only be claws. My heart skipped a beat, and the fine hairs on my neck stood on end. I decided it was a good time to head back to the tower. I half expected to see some huge beast lumbering out of the woods, but I made it back without incident. That night in the old tower, every creaking board or wind whistling through the trees kept me awake. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone out there. In the morning, I told myself I was being stupid. Wild animals leave tracks all the time, and maybe mine was just deformed. I'd misread it in the dusk. Determined to shake it off, I went back to my work on the tower, trying to focus. But there it was again, that sense of unease prickling at the back of my mind. I kept glancing down into the trees, scanning the surrounding forest line for any movement. That afternoon, it escalated. I was down at the base of the tower, fixing a broken support beam. As I was hammering, I heard it, a loud crack from somewhere in the woods behind me. I froze, the hammer still gripped tight in my hand. Another crack, closer this time, followed by the sound of heavy footsteps. I slowly put the hammer down and turned. And there it was. It took a moment for my brain to process what my eyes were seeing. Standing maybe thirty feet away among the shadows of the trees, it looked like a dog, but a dog that stood on its hind legs, easily seven feet tall. Its fur was shaggy and dark, its snout long and the eyes. Jesus, those eyes glowed with a sickly yellow light. For a few terrifying seconds, we just stared at each other. The creature snarled, showing pointed, uneven teeth. Then, suddenly, it dropped to all fours and bolted towards me. I didn't think I just ran. I sprinted towards the tower, lungs burning, the sound of crashing foliage echoing behind me. I could hear the creature gaining ground, its breath a harsh, rasping snarl. Just as I thought it was going to snatch me off my feet, I reached the ladder and began scrambling up as fast as I could. The beast lunged, its claws scraping against the bottom rungs of the ladder. I scrambled higher, kicking and flailing until I hauled myself over the railing onto the balcony and bolted inside, slamming the door shut. I don't remember much after that. I think I blacked out for a while. When I came to, it was dark and the only sound was the steady drumming of rain against the roof. My whole body ached and I felt sick with a bone-deep fear. The next morning, I ventured out onto the balcony. The ground below was muddy and trampled, evidence of the previous night's encounter. I needed to get the hell out of there, but I had tools and supplies to pack up, and no cell service to call for help. Armed with my hammer and a hunting knife, I went back down and began loading my truck. My hand shook the whole time and I kept glancing back at the tree lean. The creature didn't reappear. The rest is a blur. I drove out of there, probably breaking every speed limit imaginable. I didn't stop until I hit Grant's Pass and finally saw familiar streets and neon signs of civilization. Pulled into a cheap motel and spent a sleepless night chain-smoking and staring at the ceiling told the client the next morning there'd been a family emergency, and never went back. I know how it sounds. Some cryptid thing in the woods. It's the kind of story folks spin around campfires to spook each other. But I swear on my life, I saw something that day. I looked that thing in the eyes. I didn't imagine it. People have gone missing in those forests. Hikers, hunters, whole damn families. I don't know for sure if it's connected to what I encountered. But if you ever find yourself out there at the edge of nowhere, 
hiking alone, sleeping under the stars, remember, you might not be as alone as you think. This happened to me a few years back, just after I graduated college. I'm Ewan, by the way. I was desperate for a break from city life after four years in Chicago, so when my buddy Rhett mentioned a summer job working at his uncle's fly fishing outfitter in Montana, I jumped at the chance. Figured it was the perfect way to earn a bit of cash, clear my head, and maybe catch some of those giant trout Rhett wouldn't shut up about. The outfitter was located outside of Bozeman, in a narrow valley tucked away in the Gallatin National Forest. The nearest town, a little place called Willow Creek, was a good hour's drive away. Red's uncle, Hank, ran the whole operation, along with a couple of local guides. Rustic cabins, a well-stocked tackle shed, and a stretch of private access to the Yellowstone River. It was every angler's dream. Those first weeks were great. Mornings spent helping prep for the clients, loading up the drift boats, tying flies, all that stuff. Then afternoons on the river teaching folks to cast, or fishing myself if things were slow. In the evenings, we'd all hang out on the porch of Hank's main cabin, drink some beers, and swap fishing stories. Proper backwoods summer camp vibes. Now, I'd heard rumors about wolves or mountain lions in the area, and I figured that was the usual wildlife to look out for. Then one night, a couple of clients, a father and son from Texas, came back shaken up about something they'd seen at dusk near the river. They were sure it was a bear, huge, but claimed it walked funny, almost upright for a few steps. Hank just chuckled, told them it was probably a black bear with a messed up paw, nothing to worry about. That was how things started, that creeping feeling that maybe we weren't the only predators out there. A couple of nights later, I was closing up for the night, walking back to my cabin. That's when I heard it, a rustling sound from the trees on the far side of the clearing. I froze, listening intently. Then came a low growl, the hair-raising kind that vibrates in your bones. My flashlight beam swung toward the woods, catching two pairs of glowing yellow eyes staring back at me. For a split second, I saw that the eyes were set too high, the shape of the creature all wrong for a bear. Then they were gone, vanishing back into the darkness. I hightailed it back to my cabin and spent that night wide-eyed on the cot, every tiny noise making me jump. I didn't sleep a wink. That morning I told Rhett and Hank, downplayed it as probably just a trick of the light. Hank didn't look convinced, but Rhett just shrugged it off. I convinced myself it could have been a deformed animal, just like Hank said. But over the next few weeks, things kept happening. Fishing gear would go missing from the storage shed overnight. One morning, Rhett found a mangled deer carcass stashed behind the cabins. And that low, guttural growl became an almost nightly occurrence. Hank started carrying a rifle any time he went out on the river, and there was a grimmer vibe around the outfitter. Then one night, the worst thing happened. One of the guides— an older fella named Wyatt who loved Johnny Cash and telling tall tales, had stayed late fixing up some rods. He never made it back to his cabin. I was woken up by the sound of yelling and saw Hank and Rhett with flashlights out searching the perimeter of the clearing. We found Wyatt at the edge of the woods. I won't go into details. I still see it clearly when I try to sleep. Suffice to say... No animal I knew of could have done that. The next morning, we packed up in a hurry and drove away. Rhett's uncle swore us to silence, said it'd ruin his business, maybe get the whole place shut down. Back in Bozeman, I tried to report it, but the cops just gave me that weary look, 
like I was another drunk tourist spinning some campfire yarn. Rhett and I went our separate ways after that summer. He swore off the woods, said he never wanted a part of that life again. Me? I don't know. Sometimes I have this itch to go back. Not to confront the thing, but just to know for sure if I was crazy or not. Every time I drive through Montana, I keep thinking about turning around, about venturing up those old logging roads one last time. Just to lay eyes on whatever it was that lurked out in those woods. See, the thing is, I started researching after I got home. Found all sorts of stories in local papers, going back decades, missing hikers, mutilated livestock. And then there were the old tales whispered about by the Native American tribes in the area, legends of a creature that walked on two legs, a hunter of both animals and men. People called it a dogman, but that seemed too ridiculous to say out loud. Yet, I'd seen its eyes that night. Yellow, intelligent, and burning with a hunger that wasn't like anything nature as we know it could ever produce. Even now, especially now with Wyatt's face in my mind, part of me believes it was real. Every time I see a shadow move too quickly, every time a twig snaps in my backyard at night, it's like it's hunting me, still. Sometimes I wish I'd never taken that summer job. But most of the time, I wish I knew the truth, about what I saw, about what became of Wyatt, and whether I'll ever find peace after my terrifying brush with something monstrous, something that has no right to exist. This happened to me a few years back, just after I'd gotten laid off from my construction job. Figured I needed a change of scenery anyway, a time to clear my head and figure out what the hell to do with myself. My buddy Bryson had an aunt who owned some property up in the White Mountains near the New Hampshire main border, so I decided to head up there for a while, get some peace and quiet. Name's Eli, by the way. Bryson's aunt, Rowan, was this super granola, live-off-the-land type. Her place was basically an old homestead, a log cabin, a barn, a vegetable patch, the works. She kept chickens, a couple beehives, and was all about foraging wild edibles and that sort of stuff. My kinda crazy, but hey, the cabin was rent-free and the woods were definitely peaceful. The nearest town, Conway, was a 30-minute drive. But the property itself was way back down a dirt road, surrounded by the National Forest. Cell service was non-existent. Rowan had a sat phone for emergencies only. The first few days were great. I'd wake up to birdsong instead of sirens, spend my mornings chopping wood, afternoons just hiking through the forest. The place was thick with old pines, the ground underfoot soft with needles, the air crisp and cool. It felt like a million miles from the city. I started noticing stuff that seemed off, maybe around a weekend. Rowan was always talking to her chickens, saying they told her about the weather or whatever predators were about. I figured that was her quirkiness, until one morning, I heard her arguing with them her voice raised and kind of frantic. That evening, I was splitting logs by the barn and smelled the most foul, rotten stench. Then I heard this scrabbling noise, looked up and saw some kind of animal, big and hunched over, loping from the barn into the trees. Didn't catch a good look, but it moved wrong for any normal critter. Told Rowan about it, and she got real serious said she'd put in some calls to the wildlife folks. A few days after that, Rowan went into Conway for supplies. I was reading on the porch swing when I heard the chickens squawking, a different type of squawking than usual louder, panicked. As I got up to check it out, there was this crashing sound from the woods nearby. Then silence. 
I walked cautiously towards the tree line. Nothing. Then I saw the feathers. Blood, too. Something had ripped one of those chickens right out of its coop, shredded it. Rowan had told me there were coyotes around, maybe a bobcat at most, but as I looked at the carnage, I didn't buy it. I was shaking by the time Rowan got back. Told her what happened and she went completely white. Started mumbling about old stories from the locals about something that hunted in those woods. Something that wasn't supposed to be real. I told myself she was just spooking me, but that night I couldn't sleep. I lay there with my heart pounding, listening to every rustle and snap outside. The next morning, armed with a hatchet, I followed some drag marks into the woods where the chicken had been taken. The trail led me deeper into the pines, then abruptly stopped at a clearing. In the center of it, I saw, well, I don't know what I saw. At first, I thought it was a bear, reared up on its hind legs. But this thing was too tall, too lanky, and its limbs were all off, like they bent the wrong way. It was hunched over something in the center of the clearing, its back to me. Slowly, it turned its head. Those eyes will haunt me forever. Yellow, slitted, and they held a real, focused intelligence that no regular animal would have. Its fur was thick and black, and its snout was long, filled with long, pointed teeth. For a few seconds we just stared at each other. I was frozen, not by fear exactly, but just sheer disbelief at the impossible thing in front of me. Then, it let out a snarl like someone dragged nails across a chalkboard. I snapped to my senses and ran like hell back to the cabin. I told Rowan I had to go some family emergency. She didn't believe me, but she could see the look on my face, knew I wasn't coming back. I packed my things in a daze, got in my truck, and just drove until I saw a highway and the first signs of civilization. Pulled over, shaking, and tried to convince myself it was a dream, a trick of the light, anything but the truth. That was years ago now, and I'm still struggling to wrap my head around it. I ended up back in the city, working construction again. But there's a part of me that wonders, did I imagine the yellow eyes, the wrongness of the thing? Would it have chased me or left the tracks of its kill so openly? Sometimes I wonder if whatever it was had been watching me the whole time, maybe toying with me, like a cat with a mouse. I tell people I won't ever go back to those woods. Sometimes I say it just to reassure them. But more often than not, I say it to try to convince myself. Maybe if I go back, I can find an explanation. Or maybe I'll find the proof that will confirm I wasn't crazy. And maybe, just maybe, it will find me first. This happened to me a few years ago when I was working in Alaska. I'm a wildlife photographer, my name's Wilder. Always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie, drawn to remote places and the thrill of capturing elusive creatures. My latest project took me up to the Brooks Range, truly untamed country, grizzly bears, caribou, all the Alaskan staples. But it was the stories of wolves I heard from locals in the tiny outpost towns that really ignited my imagination. I ended up hiring a seasoned bush pilot named Harlan to fly me deep into the mountains. We found an isolated valley ringed by jagged peaks, a winding river glinting in the sun, and no sign of human presence for miles. Perfect. Harlan helped me set up a base camp a heavy-duty tent, supplies, satellite phone for emergencies, then wished me luck and flew off. I spent those first few days just soaking it in. The silence was uncanny, only punctuated by the calls of birds and the rush of the river nearby. I set up camera traps along game trails, 
hoping for glimpses of wolves, bears, anything that called this place home. Nights were freezing, the stars like diamonds in that clear mountain air. I'd never felt so small, so insignificant in the face of the vastness of the wild. About a week in, things started to feel off. It wasn't the isolation. I thrived on that. This was different, a nagging feeling, like a prickle at the back of my neck. One night, I woke with a start, sure I'd heard a howl nearby. But when I poked my head out of the tent, peering into the darkness, there was nothing. Just the wind whistling through the trees. Sleep became impossible. I kept imagining movement out of the corner of my eye. That feeling of being watched intensified, so strong I started to question my own sanity. Then came the tracks. I'd been heading back from checking a camera trap when I saw them in the muddy banks next to the river. Huge paw prints, larger than any dog or bear. It looked like the creature had walked upright. My heart slammed against my ribs. I should have packed up and called Harlan right then. Stupid pride, that need to prove myself, made me stay. The next few days were a blur of intense anxiety. I doubled the number of cameras, barely ventured from my tent unless necessity forced me. Then one morning, I discovered my camp had been visited in the night. A storage bin was chewed through, food wrappers were scattered, and worst of all, one of my cameras was missing. Whatever was out there had come within feet of my tent while I slept. My hands shook as I packed my gear, muttering curses under my breath. I had to get out. I contacted Harlan on the sat phone. His voice crackled through the static, faint but clear enough. He could be there in three hours if weather held. As I waited, I kept scanning the tree lean, rifle in hand, the sound came from behind me, a low guttural growl that made the hair on my arms stand on end. I whirled around, rifle raised. And there it was. At least seven feet tall, it stood silhouetted against the trees. The shape was roughly canine, but its posture was all wrong. It moved with a loping, uneven gait, and those eyes, they glowed pale yellow, reflecting the afternoon light with a chilling intensity. Its muzzle was long, teeth bared in a snarl, and the fur on its massive shoulders stood on end. Terror froze me in place. My finger hovered on the trigger, but there was a disconnect, like my brain couldn't process the impossibility of what I was seeing. The creature took a few slow, deliberate steps towards me. I snapped out of it, and fired a warning shot into the air. No reaction. Another shot. Still it advanced, that snarl intensifying. My third shot was a desperate one, and it struck the creature in the shoulder. To my horror, it didn't flinch. No pain cry, no blood. It only seemed to enrage it, and the beast charged, covering the distance with frightening speed. I barely had time to drop my rifle and scramble back towards my tent. The canvas ripped as I dove inside, its claws slashing through the thin wall just inches from my face. I fumbled for a flare, striking it desperately as the thing ripped a massive hole in the tent. I shoved the burning flare towards its face. It roared, a blood-chilling sound, and retreated into the trees. I slumped, shaking uncontrollably, sobs racking my body. When Harlan arrived, I was incoherent, pointing at paw prints, shredded tent fabric, babbling about yellow eyes and impossible monsters. He calmed me down, radioed for extraction, and told me I'd probably seen a bear with mange that they sometimes walked on two legs and the poor lighting could make their eyes look weird. Back in civilization, the nightmares started. Every rustle outside my window, every dog bark, sent me jolting awake, heart pounding. I saw a therapist, and they were kind, told me it was PTSD, 
a normal reaction to trauma. But deep down, I know that what I saw in that valley was more than a deformed bear. I haven't been back to the Brooks Range, and I'm not sure I ever will. Some things aren't meant to be explained, some corners of the wilderness are meant to remain untouched. Sometimes I dream of those yellow eyes, and the part of me fixated on the truth fights back a terrifying question. Did I escape it, or did it let me go? This happened to me a few years back, just after I'd moved to Idaho for a park ranger job. Call me Finn, by the way. Figured a career change was exactly what I needed after burning out in the corporate world. The fresh air, the open skies, the chance to immerse myself in nature. It was all part of my grand plan to get my life back on track. My first posting was way up in the sawtooth wilderness. Rugged, mountainous terrain, the kind that makes you feel tiny and inconsequential in the best possible way. They set me up in a remote cabin and my duties mostly involved trail maintenance, assisting the occasional lost hiker, and just keeping an eye on things in my assigned area. Those first weeks were blissful. Every morning I woke to birdsong instead of traffic. I had a whole mountain range as my backyard and didn't see another human for days at a time. But around the third weekend, things started to feel off. It began with the howl. I'd heard wolves before, their call is mournful, kind of beautiful. This was different, more drawn out, lower in pitch. And unlike a pack howl, it was just a single, lonely cry echoing across the valley. I heard it again the next night, then the next. Then came the sightings. Just glimpses out of the corner of my eye. A large, dark shape moving between the trees. A flash of yellow in the twilight. Always leaving me with the sense of being watched. I told myself it must be an unusually bold lone wolf. Or a trick of the light. I knew how the mind plays games when you're alone in the wilderness. One morning, I was hiking a high-altitude trail when I spotted the tracks too big to be a cougar, and the claws were retractable, not like a bear. And they were bipedal, walking on two feet. Whatever made them walked upright like a human. My pulse quickened, but I told myself it was probably a hoax, someone messing with the new ranger. I wish I'd packed it in right then. But driven by a mix of curiosity and a stubborn refusal to let fear dictate my actions, I kept following the tracks until they dropped down into a densely forested ravine. Big mistake. That's when I saw it. Hunched between the trees, at least seven feet tall, its form was powerfully built. The fur was shaggy and dark, its face wolfish but elongated, with teeth far too long and flat for a canine. And then its eyes met mine, those yellow eyes, filled with a cold intelligence that made my skin crawl. Paralysis set in for a few moments, then pure survival instinct kicked in. I turned and ran, tearing back up the trail, ignoring the burning in my lungs and the way my legs trembled. The thing didn't pursue me immediately, but I felt its eyes boring into my back every step of the way. I barricaded myself in my cabin that night, rifle at my side, heart pounding like a trapped rabbit. There were strange noises around my cabin, rustling outside the window, clawing sounds at the door, heavy footsteps circling the perimeter. At one point, there was a blood-curdling howl right outside, loud enough to shake the whole cabin. I barely slept. Each time I drifted off, I jolted awake, imagining the crash of splintering wood and those yellow eyes peering into the darkness. At dawn, I cautiously peered outside expecting to see a scene of destruction. Nothing. No sign of the creature at all. My mind started its familiar cycle of self-doubt. Maybe I had dreamed it, 
hallucinated from stress and isolation. Desperate to get the hell out of there, I contacted headquarters on the Ranger radio, told them about the howl, the tracks, and played it all down, making it sound like I was worried about a possible aggressive wolf, not some thing I couldn't even bring myself to name. The other rangers, bless them, decided to send an extraction chopper. As I waited on a nearby ridge, my eyes darted to the treeline, expecting the creature to come crashing through at any moment. The chopper arrived, and I scrambled inside, feeling a surge of relief as we lifted off into the clear blue sky. Back at headquarters, I filed a full report even included rough sketches of the creature despite feeling an overwhelming sense of absurdity at the whole situation. The other rangers were sympathetic but skeptical. Locals had stories, they said, tall tales of a creature known as a dogman. Most folks dismissed them as myth and campfire stories. I don't know for sure what I saw. Was it a cryptid, a creature of legend? Was it some unknown species, misidentified by a stressed-out rookie ranger? Or could it be just like they said, folklore that wormed its way into my overactive imagination? What I do know is this, sometimes, out there on the edges of the map, things don't follow the rules we're familiar with. Sometimes the impossible edge is closer, blurring the line between what we know and what lurks in the shadows of the wilderness. I never went back to the sawtooths. City life ain't so bad after all. But at night, when I hear a siren wail, a low mournful sound in the distance, a part of me wonders if that's an echo of the howl I heard in the mountains, and whether whatever made it still roams the wild places, waiting for another lost soul to stumble into its territory. This happened to me a few years ago, not that I like to talk about it. I was working as a park ranger out in Yellowstone. It's a beautiful place, and the job was fantastic in most respects. I had plenty of downtime, a little cabin all to myself, and could spend hours just hiking, watching wildlife, or enjoying the peace and quiet. It's hard to express how remote some of the park really is, though. My name's Kellen, by the way. Back then, I was still pretty young. Fresh out of college and keen to put my conservation studies to work. One late afternoon in the early fall, I got a call about a missing hiker up near Slough Creek. Now, people get lost all the time around there. It's rough terrain, and tourists often underestimate how quickly things can turn. Search and rescue isn't my usual thing but it's a big park, and we were a little understaffed. So, I suited up and headed out. The sun was already dipping when I started up the trail, figuring it was best to make it to the last reported location of the hiker before nightfall. That part of the park isn't heavily trafficked, so once the main trail narrowed, the going got tougher. I've hiked those woods since I was little, but the way the light shifts around dusk, the shadows, it can get disorienting. A couple of times I almost swore there was something huge moving just past my peripheral vision. About two miles in, I found remnants of a campsite, a ripped-up tent, gear scattered all around, food wrappers. No hiker, though. That wasn't a good sign. Then I saw the blood. It didn't take an expert to tell something big had torn through there and recently. I radioed in an update, letting them know I'd found a possible attack site. The reply back was crackly, the usual. Stay on alert, help is on the way. You get on the two-way radios when you're out in the sticks. I knelt to get a better look at the scene. That's when I heard it, breathing, like someone was watching. At first, I thought maybe the missing hiker was injured, hiding nearby. But when I turned, all I saw was dense trees. I called out, 
my voice echoing eerily through the forest. No reply. Still, a prickle of unease ran down my spine. The breathing sounded, wrong. Heavy labored. I was debating whether to try and move deeper into the woods when I caught a flicker of motion again. This time I didn't hesitate, shining my high-powered flashlight straight into the trees. That's when I saw it. I'll try to describe it, but words can't do it justice. It was tall, at least seven feet, maybe more. But not quite human in how it moved. Massive shoulders, long arms, hunched over a bit as it lurked just beyond the reach of my light. The head, I'll never forget the head. Canine-like, elongated snout with teeth that reflected the light of the flashlight. And the eyes, glowing yellow, filled with a cold intelligence that sent a chill straight through me. It stood there for just a moment, then vanished back into the darkness with an impossible burst of speed. I stumbled backward, nearly dropping the flashlight. Rational thought went out the window. I fumbled with the radio, my hands shaking as I called in what I'd seen, voice panicked. I don't even remember exactly what I said. Something about a creature, an attack. The reply back was slow, confused. Repeat that, ranger. Over. That's when the thing let out a roar. Not a bear, not a wolf. A primal, bone-chilling sound that vibrated through the forest. My mind raced. Whatever this was, it was dangerous. It had already destroyed the camp, possibly taken the hiker. And now... It seemed to be circling back to me. I bolted. There was no plan, just blind instinct to get away from that horrifying sound. I ran like never before, branches whipping my face, stones tearing at my boots. I could hear it crashing through the woods behind me, the heavy thuds of its feet getting closer. Then, as quickly as it began, the chase stopped. The woods fell silent again. I kept running, my breath rasping, until I stumbled onto a familiar trail. Relief flooded through me. I knew this path. It led back to the main road. Someone would be there soon. Help would arrive. I hoped. I made it back to my truck as twilight turned the sky bruised purple and collapsed into the seat, utterly spent. It took a while before the shaking subsided enough to get the keys into the ignition. Just when I started the engine, I saw a figure standing at the edge of the light cast by my headlights. It was the creature. Taller, clearer in the dimness. Its eyes burned into mine, locking me in place. I scrambled for my service weapon under the seat, but fumbled as the creature slowly paced towards the truck. It circled my vehicle, occasionally pressing itself against the windows. I could see its matted fur, its long claws scraping the glass. Minutes stretched into eternity. It felt like a sick game, watching me trapped and terrified. Finally, with one last lingering glance, it loped back into the trees and disappeared. I didn't wait around. I threw the truck in gear and tore down the road, radioing as I drove. The response was, well, let's say my story went over like a lead balloon. Backup arrived, a full search team. We scoured that area. No sign of the creature, no missing hiker, no shredded tent, nothing but my word. Officially, the case is open. Unofficially, I think everyone chalked it up to a bare sighting where fear and poor light exaggerated things. The higher-ups subtly suggested stress, exhaustion. I even started to doubt myself. Except deep down, I know what I saw. Every time I close my eyes, I see that elongated snout pressed against the window, those glowing eyes watching me. There's something out there in those woods that nobody talks about. Some nights, lying in bed, I still think I hear that raspy breathing outside. I started carrying again, even in town. 
People give me funny looks when they notice the sidearm, but better safe than sorry. I left the park service shortly after that. Too many reminders. Sometimes I wonder if I should track it down, try to get proof. But a smarter part of me, the part that wants to sleep at night, tells me to just leave it alone. Because some mysteries, maybe they're better left unsolved. This happened to me a few years ago, not that I like to talk about it. I was working as a park ranger out in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful spot, or at least so I thought until all this happened. It was my job to check out all the trails, make sure everything was safe and maintained right. I was pretty fit, in my mid-twenties then. Liked the solitary work and figured if I ever did bump into a bare well, that was part of the territory, right? Things started out simple enough. I was walking the South Loop Trail. It's a little less traveled than some of the others out there. There'd been a downed tree a few miles back. I was hauling a chainsaw, all set to clear it up. Now I heard something moving off to my right. I froze. Bear? Probably. No reason to panic. Plenty of them out there, and they tend to steer clear of humans. But this didn't sound like a bear. Movement was too light, too wrong. The hair on the back of my neck prickled. I hefted the chainsaw, the low hum of the motor somewhat comforting. Maybe whatever it was would take the hint and back off. I crept forward a bit, peering through the trees. And then I saw it. Not fully, just a glimpse. But enough to make me do a double take. That was big, bigger than any bear. It was upright, walking on two legs like a person, but huge and covered in thick fur. The shape of the head was all wrong. My first thought was honestly some lunatic in a costume, trying to prank hikers. Morons did it sometimes but this thing moved like nothing human. It turned its head as if it sensed me. For just a second, under all that fur, I thought I saw eyes glinting yellow. Adrenaline coursed through me. Forget the damn tree. I was getting out of there. I turned and started back the way I came, half jogging at first, then picking up speed. Branches whipped at my face. I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched, that thing stalking silently behind me. Back at the ranger station, I found my buddy, Marcus, manning the desk. You look like you saw a ghost, Ben, he chuckled. Almost did, I replied, trying for a nonchalance I didn't feel. I mentioned the downed tree, nothing more. Marcus grumbled about heading out to fix it and I took the opportunity to slip into the back room and snag a bottle of water. My hands were still shaking. The next few days went by without incident. Still, I couldn't shake that feeling of something out in the woods, watching. Every snap twig sent a jolt of fear down my spine. People went missing in parks sometimes, freak accidents, animal attacks. But what I'd seen didn't fit with any of that. It was straight-up nightmare stuff. My buddy Kyle was a bit of a conspiracy nerd. When I finally broke down and told him what I saw, he lit up like I just confirmed the existence of Bigfoot himself. Dogman, he exclaimed. That's what you saw. You gotta report this, man. Yeah, and get laughed out of my job? I scoffed. But Kyle was insistent. He went on about other reported sightings in the region, vague stories on the internet about disappearances and mutilated cattle. None of it seemed solid, yet doubt started to worm its way into my mind. It wasn't impossible. Just very, very unlikely. One morning I headed out early for another patrol. The air felt heavy. Storm brewing, maybe? 
Something in my gut told me not to go, but I brushed it off. Couldn't let fear dictate my life. And I needed to prove to myself there was nothing out there, that I was just being an idiot. Miles in, with no sign of trouble, I started to relax. See? All in my head. But a sound stopped me short. A snarling growl that chilled my blood. It was coming from uphill, not too far off. My pulse thrummed in my ears. Had it followed me? Was it waiting to ambush? Gun. I had a sidearm, standard issue for the park. Shaking hands fumbled for it, drawing it from the holster. And then it came hurtling out from the trees, a blur of dark fur and snapping teeth. I had just enough time to raise the pistol and fire a few wild shots before it slammed into me. Pain exploded in my shoulder as claws sunk in. I screamed, the heavy weight of it pinning me down. The smell of wet fur and something rank filled my nostrils. I struggled kicking out, but the thing was just too strong. My gun flew from my grip, useless. A monstrous face loomed over me. Yellow eyes burning, snout pulled back in a snarl, teeth like daggers. Terror flooded through me. This was how it would end. A flicker of movement beyond it caught my eye. Marcus. He'd come looking for me when I didn't check in as scheduled. Marcus had his rifle. He fired, and the creature jolted, its grip on me loosening slightly. I scrambled back, scrambled to my feet. We took off running, Marcus shouting for me to follow. Branches ripped at us. My injured shoulder was throbbing, but I kept going, fueled by sheer terror. Back at the station, we were a mess, me bleeding profusely and both of us shaking like leaves. Marcus bandaged me as best he could, all the while demanding the full story. He believed me, even if his face had gone pale as a sheet. The report we filed, that was a different matter. Animal attack, bear maybe, got lucky. We both knew it was a lie, but what else could we say? I didn't stick around in that job much longer. I don't know if that thing is still out there and I don't want to find out. Sometimes, late at night, I still think I hear the sound of claws scrabbling against glass outside my window, but it's probably just my imagination. Probably. This happened to me a couple of years back. I was living in Nevada, about an hour outside of Vegas. Sounds glamorous, but it was a small town, the kind everyone dreams of leaving. I worked at a gas station on the main highway, saving up while I figured out my next move. Wasn't much to do besides hang out with friends or go for hikes in the Red Rock Canyon sometimes. One evening... I was closing up shop, counting the cash register, when two guys rolled in, rough types, bikers by the look of them. They didn't buy anything, just sort of milled around while I finished up. One of them, the bigger one, kept giving me a look that made my skin crawl. When I finally got them out of there and locked the doors, I was on edge. The parking lot was dimly lit, and the nearest building was a good ways off. I hurried to my car, fumbling with the keys. I glanced over my shoulder both bikers were standing in the shadows, just watching me go. A chill ran through me. I managed to get in the car, but my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't get the key into the ignition. One of the bikers started walking towards me, and that's when I finally took off. I fishtailed out of the lot, tires squealing and didn't look in the rear view until was safely on the highway. That night I hardly slept. Next day, my friend Cassie offered to drive me to work just in case. She laughed it off as me being paranoid, but I appreciated the company. On the way, 
She mentioned a piece of local news that had been bothering her. Someone had gone missing while hiking in the canyon. Not that rare, unfortunately, accidents happen. But something about it stuck with me. Work was slow that day. No sign of the bikers, thankfully. I kept glancing out the window, half expecting trouble even though Cassie insisted there was no way those guys were still hanging around. As the sun began to set, I got that uneasy feeling again. The desert gets a chill to it right at dusk, and that, mixed with my still jangled nerves, had me ready to close up early. I did my usual walk around, flipped off the outside lights, and was just about to lock up when I heard it, a rustling sound from behind the station. I froze. Cassie was still inside, messing around on her phone. Cassie, I hissed, get outside right now. She finally looked up, startled, then walked over to the door. I kept my eyes on the darkened back lot, the hairs on my arm prickling. What's up? she asked. I don't know, I breathed. I heard something. We stared out into the gloom, but it was hard to see anything clearly. And then, movement. A large shape detached itself from the shadows and stood upright. My breath hitched in my throat. It was massive, easily seven feet tall and covered in dark fur. For a crazy second, I thought it was a bear somehow lost in the desert. But the way it walked, the hunched posture, that wasn't right. Cassie let out a strangled gasp. The thing in the shadows turned its head, and in the fading light, I saw its eyes, yellow, glinting like a predator's. The door exploded open, the thing charging. Cassie shrieked and dived behind the counter as I slammed the door shut and fumbled for the lock. I heard claws scrape against the metal, a snarling noise that sent panic surging through me. Dial 911! I shouted at Cassie, my voice shaking. She was hyperventilating, fumbling her phone from her pocket with trembling hands. The thing bashed against the door again, the flimsy thing rattling against its monstrous strength. We both knew it wouldn't hold for long. I had to get us out of there. The car! I yelled. We have to run for it! Cassie scrambled up, her face white. We didn't have time to think, just move. I flung the door open and took off across the lot. Behind us, I heard the screech of metal tearing and an inhuman roar that echoed through the night. I kept running, my lungs burning, Cassie just behind me. The creature burst through the doorway. Moonlight glinted off its bared fangs as it loped after us. We were almost at the car when Cassie stumbled, fell hard to the gravel. Cassie, get up! I screamed. She scrambled to her feet, but it was too late. The creature was on her, knocking her flat with a swipe of its massive paw. I heard her cry of pain cut short. Then I was in the car, hands fumbling for the keys, the engine roaring to life. I swung the car around in a cloud of dust my headlights catching the monstrous figure standing over Cassie's body. For just one horrifying second, it looked up, straight at me, and those yellow eyes seared into my brain. I peeled out onto the road, not stopping until I was miles away. When I finally pulled over and dialed 911, my hands wouldn't stop shaking. The police came, of course. Took my statement— Searched the gas station, found nothing but the shredded back door and poor Cassie. Well, what was left of her? They wrote it off as an animal attack. Mountain lion, maybe, even though it didn't fit the typical profile. I went back to work. The owners boarded up the back door. Life went on as best as it could. But I saw that thing, saw what it did. And those eyes... Those haunt my nightmares still. I left that town a few months after. Don't know if I ever fully escaped, though. 
Every time I walk alone at night, every time I hear a noise outside, I can feel its gaze burning into me, waiting in the darkness. This happened to me a few years back when I was living in Vermont. I worked in a small hardware store in a town on the edge of the Green Mountain National Forest. Lived in that town most of my life. It's one of those places where everyone knows everyone, and not much exciting ever happens. Guess I should have been careful what I wished for. I was the type that liked to go out hiking on the weekends. There are trails all over those mountains, some easier than others. I preferred the more remote ones, the sense of quiet and being alone in the woods. That's probably where I made my mistake. One Saturday, I decided to try a new trail, an old logging path that had fallen into disuse. It wasn't marked on most maps, but a local outdoorsman told me about it, said it was a challenge, but had some nice views from the top. I packed my backpack, filled with the usual supplies, and set out early under a clear blue sky. The beginning of the trail was rough but manageable. You could tell it had been years since anyone was up there fallen trees in places, brush so thick you had to push your way through. Still, I enjoyed it. The further in I went, the wilder it felt. My city worries started to melt away. That's when I started to feel a prickle at the back of my neck. That sense of not being quite alone. I stopped, listened. Nothing but the wind through the leaves and the occasional bird call. I chalked it up to being too used to the quiet and pressed on. But that unease didn't go away. It got stronger, the feeling of eyes watching me. I came to a clearing at one point. I looked around, a shiver going down my spine. Then I saw it. Just inside the tree lean, there was a deer carcass. That itself wasn't strange, but the state it was in, the flesh had been torn and shredded, almost like something big had been gnawing on it. My stomach turned. It could have been a coyote, or mountain lion maybe but something about it felt wrong. I hurried on, trying to shake off the bad feeling. The rest of the hike up was all uphill and pretty tough, but finally, the trees thinned out, and I broke through onto a rocky outcrop near the summit. The view was something else, for sure. Miles of dense forest unfurled below, with distant peaks breaking the horizon. I sat for a while, taking it all in, reaching for a water bottle. And that's when I heard the growl. Low and guttural, it seemed to come from directly behind me. I spun around, heart pounding. There it was, half hidden in the low scrub about twenty yards away. A massive, wolf-like creature, almost seven feet tall when it stood on its hind legs. Thick, dark fur covered its body, its snout pulled back in a snarl revealing rows of bone-crushing teeth. But what stuck with me were those eyes, yellow and burning with a vicious intelligence. It wasn't any wolf or mountain lion that I'd ever seen. In that moment, I realized the stories about things in those woods, things dismissed as local folklore, might not be so far-fetched after all. I scrambled to my feet. The thing took a step forward. I wasn't sticking around to confirm its menu preferences. I took off running back down the mountainside, half falling, half sliding through the brush. I could hear the creature give chase, its claws raking through gravel, followed by the crashing of its powerful body through the trees. I had no plan except to get away. My lungs ached. Branches whipped against my face and arms. At one point I tripped, rolled hard down a small embankment, and landed in a heap at the bottom. I lay there for what felt like forever, listening for any sign of the creature. When finally I gathered the courage to sneak a peek back uphill, I saw nothing. I don't know how, 
but I managed to get back to the trailhead, my car waiting like a beacon of safety. I got inside, slamming the door shut, hands shaking so badly I couldn't get the keys in the ignition. It took several tries before I was roaring off down the dirt road, not stopping until I was back in town. I didn't call the cops. Who would believe me? I didn't mention it to any of my friends either. They'd think I went crazy. But I know what I saw. The memory still haunts me. Every time the wind whispers through the trees, I think of the sound of it crashing through the underbrush, its snarls, and those burning yellow eyes. There's talk sometimes about missing hikers up in those mountains, disappearances they pin on bad weather or accidents. I have my own theories on some of them. And I never, ever, go hiking alone anymore. I'd heard tales of dogmen, but always dismissed them as pure fiction. Now, well, I'm not so sure. This happened to me a few years ago. Not that I like to talk about it. I was working as a park ranger out in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful spot, or at least so I thought until all this happened. It was my job to check out all the trails, make sure everything was safe and accessible for hikers. Most of it was easy work, but some of the trails got pretty remote. One morning... I was heading out to do a check on the Bowman Lake Trail. That was one of the more rugged trails in the whole park. Not many people took it, at least not early in the season when I was out there. My buddy, Cuddale, was supposed to be with me, but he called in sick. Figures right? I hate going out alone, especially into the less populated areas. So there I was, setting out by myself, headed for the wilderness. At first, it was a pretty normal hike. Great scenery, peaceful, the way it's meant to be, right? But about halfway in, I started to get this uneasy feeling. You know, the kind where the hair on the back of your neck stands up. I stopped to listen, scan the woods, but I couldn't find anything specific to be worried about. Figured it was probably just nerves at being out there by myself. The deeper I went into the woods, the stronger this unsettling feeling got. I tried to brush it off, but it was hard. There was this smell. It was strange, hard to place. Almost gamey, musky, but with a sickly sweet edge to it that I couldn't identify. About a mile in, I came across something that sent chills down my spine. Some kind of animal carcass, but torn to shreds. The remains were too ragged, not like any predator I knew would leave them. The whole area had this wrongness to it, almost like the air itself was infected. My skin crawled. I should have headed back to the station right then. Instead, I decided to push on a little longer trying to convince myself it was just a fluke, some weird natural occurrence. Bad call. I rounded a bend in the trail and almost stumbled right into something that froze my blood. There, clear as day, was a huge set of tracks. Like enormous. Nothing like a bear or a mountain lion. They looked almost canine, but way, way bigger. And then I saw the claw marks on a nearby tree, the gashes far too high to have been any animal I'd ever seen. My body reacted before my brain could process what I was seeing. I took off running, heart pounding so hard I thought it might explode. I didn't know what was back there, but I wasn't about to stick around and find out. I raced back the way I'd come, branches whipping me the stench of that carcass getting stronger with every step. And then I heard it, heavy, panting breaths, the snap of a twig far behind me. Whatever made those tracks, it was following. Panic kicked in full force. I tore through the underbrush, not caring where I was headed, just away from that thing. 
but it kept coming, gaining on me. Its breaths were guttural, snorting, something about the sound wasn't fully animal. As I ran, a clearing came into view. I sprinted for it, desperately hoping that being out in the open would give me some advantage. I burst out of the tree lean, and then nearly tripped over my own feet. There, in the middle of the clearing, were more tracks just like the ones I had seen, and the fresh carcass of a deer, ripped apart just like the first. That's when a shadow moved at the far edge of the clearing. I whipped my head around and saw it. Not a bear, not a mountain lion, not anything I recognized. It stood on two legs, easily seven feet tall and covered in dark, coarse fur. Its head was wolf-like, but off. The muzzle too long, the teeth too huge. And the eyes, those eyes were intelligent in a terrifying way, burning into me, pinning me in place. We just stared at each other for what felt like an eternity. Then it dropped onto all fours and charged. I don't know how I even moved. Instinct took over. I lunged to the side as it barreled past, just barely avoiding razor-sharp claws. I stumbled back into the trees, knowing it was only a matter of time before it circled on me again. I ran blindly, the creature's snarls hot on my heels. My mind scrambled for any way out, but I was deep in the wilderness, miles from help. Branches tore at my clothes and skin, but I didn't dare slow down. With a surge of desperation, I spotted it, a river, cutting through the dense forest. Maybe if I could cross, lose it on the other side, it was a long shot, but I was out of options. I burst onto the bank, my lungs burning. The creature was close behind, its eyes gleaming like coals as it gained ground. I didn't hesitate. I hurled myself into the icy water. The current was strong, almost dragging me under. I fought with all my strength, gasping for air as I struggled toward the opposite bank. Suddenly, the snarls and crashing stopped. I risked a glance back. The creature was there, on the river bank, pacing back and forth in a frenzy. It didn't seem able or willing to cross the water. Was I safe? Adrenaline pumping, I reached the other side and staggered into the trees. I kept running, though my body was on the verge of collapse. I didn't stop until I reached a road, where I managed to flag down a passing truck. When park authorities investigated my report, they found no trace of the creature. The carcasses I'd seen were gone, too. They chalked it up to stress, hallucinations brought on by being alone in the wild. The thing is, I know what I saw. They might not believe me, but the memory of those eyes haunts me to this day. Kadeel never came back to work. His disappearance was unsolved and folks whispered that maybe he'd met the same fate as those animals in the woods. Sometimes I wonder if that thing had gotten him. Had it been stalking us both? I never went back to the Bowman Lake Trail, couldn't even stand to look at a map of the area. I found a new job, something indoors, in a city with lots of people around. The wilderness doesn't feel safe anymore. Sometimes, in the darkest hours of the night, I swear I can still smell that musky, sweet odor. And I hear a low, panting breath right outside my window. This happened to me a few years ago, back when I was a fishing guide up in Alaska. Beautiful place, wild and untouched, or so I thought. My name's Wyatt, and taking tourists out on charters was how I made my living. I knew those waters better than anyone. One day, I get this booking from a guy named Killian. Seemed a little twitchy, but rich guys often are, so I didn't think much of it. We took my boat out, headed toward one of my favorite spots along the coastline. 
Killian didn't waste time with small talk, which was fine by me. He seemed obsessed with going further north, into this remote bay I usually avoided. The waters were rougher there, and the fishing wasn't any better. But hey, when a client pays like he did, you don't argue. As the day wore on, Killian started getting real antsy. It wasn't just fishing he was after that seemed clear. He kept pacing, mumbling to himself, staring off over the waves like he expected something to appear. I started to get an uneasy feeling, figuring this dude was off his rocker. The sun was setting by the time we reached the bay. Place was deserted, surrounded by thick pines that reached down to the water's edge. The whole vibe felt off. We'll drop anchor here, Killian ordered, his voice oddly high-pitched. Did that sound like excitement? Fear? I tried to reason with him. Listen, we're losing daylight. Maybe we should head back. He cut me off, eyes flashing dangerously. Shut up and do your job. This is it. That's when I saw it. Some kind of carcass washed up on the shore. Deer, maybe, but mangled and gnawed, like something powerful had ripped it apart. And there was this smell, rotting meat mixed with something sickly sweet and unfamiliar. Killian was staring at it, a strange hunger in his eyes. Before I could get another word in, Killian started ranting. About legends, about something ancient living out in the wilderness. He was babbling about a fortune, about knowledge that could change the world. I thought he'd completely lost his mind. Suddenly, he pointed towards the trees. There! He shrieked, his voice almost a howl. It took me a second to make sense of the shape moving through the shadows. Huge, lumbering, and bipedal. Can't say bear or moose, because it didn't look like anything normal out there. It stood about seven feet tall, covered in shaggy dark fur. And the face, like a wolf, all teeth and snout, but stretched wrong, the eyes gleaming with a terrible intelligence. Killian was scrambling, grabbing something from his bag. A gun, not a hunting rifle, but a military-looking thing. He started firing, bullets echoing across the quiet bay. The creature let out a roar that shook me to my bones, part howl, part something I couldn't place. Then it charged. The boat rocked violently as it lunged, raking across the hull with claws that left deep gouges in the metal. Killian kept firing, and it seemed to stagger, but it didn't go down. I yanked the anchor up and gunned the motor, but the creature was quick, leaping from the shore toward the stern. Killian screamed, not like a man in fear, but like a fanatic. The thing swiped at him, catching his leg and dragging him overboard into those icy waters. There was a splash, a scream abruptly cut short, then nothing. Only a smear of blood swirling on the surface. I didn't look back. I steered us out of there, my heart pounding a deafening rhythm in my ears. Radio was useless that far out. It was nightfall by the time I made it back to port, reported a boating accident, a client lost at sea. They searched for the body, for the boat, but found nothing. Nobody believed my story, of course. Figured it was shock, some kind of breakdown. I tried to go back to work, to convince myself it was a freak occurrence, a nightmare but the waters didn't feel safe anymore. Every dark shape in the waves made me flinch. Every rustle in the trees along the shore set my teeth on edge. Folks say there are things still out there, creatures we haven't catalogued, that exist just outside our view. After what I saw, I'm one of the believers now. This happened to me a few years ago, not that I like to talk about it. 
I was working as a park ranger out in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful spot, or at least so I thought until all this happened. It was my job to check out all the trails, make sure everything was safe and maintained right. I was pretty fit, in my mid-twenties back then, the kind of guy who thought he could handle anything the woods threw his way. One particular trail, the Hidden Falls Trail, was a little more remote. Took a solid half a day to do it there and back, but it was one of those hikes that felt worth the effort. So I had my gear, my water, radio all checked out. I set off up the trail, enjoying the quiet and the birds calling. It felt so peaceful. About an hour into the hike, I smelled something. It was hard to describe, kind of musky, but also rancid. It gave me a bad vibe. I paused for a minute trying to sense the direction it was coming from, but then it went away. I convinced myself it was just some rotting vegetation, nothing serious. I kept hiking along. A while later, I spotted some old scat on the trail, looked like bear. But then I saw claw marks gouged into a tree trunk. They were way too high up to be from a normal black bear, even a grizzly bear. It started freaking me out. It was around that point I stopped feeling quite so alone. This trail wound down into a little valley, then climbed up the other side, and that's when I heard something. It was like a clicking sound, a rhythmic, tapping noise. Then I saw movement in the trees ahead. I froze up. All I saw was a dark shape between the branches, then it was gone. My heart was pounding. I tried the radio, but it was dead silent out there. I started walking faster, feeling this sense of dread weighing down on me. Up ahead I heard a crash, like something big moving through the bushes. I stopped, listening intently. It was the clicking again, louder, like something getting closer. I was terrified, every instinct in me screaming to run, but my feet felt stuck to the ground. Then I saw it. This thing emerged from the woods. Tall, way taller than any man, hunched over a bit, covered in thick, dark fur. It stood on two legs, but there was a wrongness to its movements, like it wasn't meant to walk upright. The worst was its head, canid, like a wolf, but two elongated, the muzzle jutting out too far. Those eyes, staring straight at me, glowing a weird kind of yellow. For a moment, we were locked in this standoff. I couldn't move, couldn't even breathe right. It didn't lunge for me, it just looked. Then it bared its teeth, way too many teeth, and let out this thing between a growl and a howl. It was deep, guttural, almost inhuman. That sound finally snapped me out of my trance. I turned and ran. I didn't think, just bolted down the trail, branches smacking my face, thorns scraping my arms. It was behind me. I could hear it. The clicking sounds getting faster. The trail wound through some trees, and I used the cover, veering off into the woods. I stumbled into a small clearing and there, to my horror, was a pile of bones. Human bones. Someone didn't make it out of these woods, and I might be next. Panic drove me deeper into the undergrowth, scrambling on my hands and knees. I didn't know where I was going, just away from that thing. Thorns ripped at me, but I barely felt it. Then I hit a slope and started tumbling rolling. I smashed against a tree, the impact knocking the breath out of me. When I came to, it was dark. I was disoriented, hurt, but at least the clicking was gone. I somehow found my feet, half crawled, half staggered in the direction I thought might lead back to civilization. My radio buzzed back to life and I nearly cried with relief. I managed to call for help, voice shaky, teeth rattling. I'd been out there hours by then. 
The other rangers found me a couple hours later. They saw the state of me, all torn up, and immediately started asking questions. I mumbled some crap about a bear, not wanting to sound crazy. They didn't press it. Guess they saw enough out there to know weird stuff happens. I filed an incident report, and that was that. Took me weeks to recover. The scratches, the bruises, they healed fine. It was the rest of it that stuck with me. The image of that creature, the memory of that sound, it haunted me. I never went back on that trail, and I didn't stay much longer as a ranger either. Sometimes, out in the city, late at night, I still think I hear that clicking sound. Makes me turn up the TV real loud, and bolt the door shut. I told some folks what happened, but they just look at me like I'm nuts. Maybe I am, but I know what I saw. People talk about Bigfoot and all those other cryptids, but let me tell you, there are worse things out there, things that make Bigfoot look like a friendly cartoon. I ran into something truly monstrous in those woods, and I count myself lucky, no, blessed, that I made it out alive. This happened to me a few years back, right before I got married, actually. I'm a hiker through and through. I mean, I live for getting out on trails, the feeling of being immersed in nature, you know? Back then, my fiancé and I took what was supposed to be a romantic trip to Olympic National Park in Washington State. We planned a big hike on the Ho River Trail, the kind you want to leave yourself the whole day for. The trailhead was crowded that morning, which already put me a little on edge. I like my solitude in the woods. Anyway, we got underway, my fiancé, Sarah, chatting a mile a minute, me half listening while keeping an eye on the dense forest around us. It's beautiful, primeval stuff out there. Massive old-growth trees dripping moss, sunlight barely reaching the ground. It can feel like a different world. A couple miles in, Sarah decided to hang back and take some photographs. She's big into that. I figured, why not? I knew the trail, so I kept going, telling her I'd wait for her up ahead where things opened up a bit. Honestly, I was happy for some time alone. There's a kind of peace I find out there I never get in the city. I must have been zoning out on the trail, because suddenly a smell hit me almost like rotting meat, but more, wrong. I can't place it any better than that. It made my stomach turn. I looked around, alert now, trying to figure out where it was coming from. Up ahead, I heard an odd sound. Kinda like someone clicking a ballpoint pen really fast, over and over. Then I caught movement, a large, dark shape slipping behind a moss-covered trunk. In that split second, all I registered was that it didn't look like any animal I recognized. My mind went straight to bear, but something was off. Too big, the shape was wrong. Then it was gone, and I was standing there with that awful stench still in my nose, feeling spooked like never before. My hiker's brain wrestled with the scared kid part of me, and the hiker's brain won. I convinced myself it must have been a trick of the light, and the weird smell was just some fungus. I kept going, trying to shake off the jitters. Further up the trail, I noticed something strange. It was almost like a pattern of scratches on the tree trunks, starting low down but getting higher up like whatever made them was able to stand up taller. That bare idea came creeping back with a vengeance— and even though it didn't seem right, I couldn't think of what else it was. Just as Sarah caught up, I saw what looked like a big pile of fur up ahead in a clearing. I stopped, my hackles rising. Sarah walked right on by like she hadn't even noticed it. I called her back, pointing it out. We both got closer, and the smell hit us full force. 
Now I could see bones mixed into the fur, and worse. Some of those bones looked human. I don't remember much after that, except this rising sense of pure terror. It was the primal kind of fear that makes your brain say, Run! And so we did. We tore back down the trail, past all the points I'd carefully noted on the way up. I didn't care. Whatever made those scratches, whatever left that pile of, of remains, wasn't something I wanted to stick around and find out about. We didn't talk much about it on the drive back. Sarah was pretty shaken up, too. It's the kind of thing you try to push to the back of your mind, convince yourself you must have been mistaken or, or something. But there was no mistaking those scratches and bones. We filed the report with a park ranger when we got back, but they seemed disbelieving, like we must have been spooked by a bear or something. I looked into missing persons cases in the park afterward. Turns out, there's more than a few. People just vanish on those trails with no explanation. Makes me think back to that clicking sound, the way it seemed to get closer the further I hiked in, like I was being lured further out. Whatever's out there, it doesn't want to be seen. A couple months after the trip, Sarah and I still had the wedding, but something had changed. We weren't those same outdoors of people anymore. I sold my hiking gear a few months ago. We both stick to city parks now. Sometimes I hear that clicking sound in my nightmares, see a hulking shape out of the corner of my eye in the shadows. I know it wasn't a bear, wasn't any wild animal I know of. Some people believe in Bigfoot and stuff, but what I saw, whatever it was, felt crueler. Like it knew how to think, how to hunt. I think there are things out in the wild places, things we're not meant to encounter. Maybe some trails are best left untrod. This happened to me a few years back, when I was working construction in Wyoming. It's one of those places people don't think about much, but there's wild country out there, the Wind River Range, Yellowstone not too far off. Me, I've always had an outdoors a streak. Hunting, fishing, camping, even during this construction gig. I rented a little cabin outside of town to get away from the crews when work was done. Now, this cabin was out there, I mean really isolated. Nearest neighbors must have been a mile away, which was fine by me. One morning, I decided to head up into the foothills, just a little day hike to explore the area. I'd packed a lunch, grabbed my rifle, always good to have protection back then, and set off. The air was crisp, the trail led upward through thick pines. It was quiet out there, a nice change from the noise of the construction site. I felt myself relaxing more with every step I took. About an hour in, I got this prickle on the back of my neck, the feeling of being watched. I stopped, scanned the trees around me, saw nothing. Probably just a squirrel, I told myself. But that feeling persisted, like I wasn't alone. Further on, the trees thinned out, and I came to a stream bed. And that's where I saw it. Bones. Scattered across the sandy bank. Deer mainly, from the look of things. But something about it was, off. There were too many of them, for one. And some of the bones looked big, the kind of size I couldn't place. I walked closer, my heart starting to beat a little faster. One bone had teeth marks in it, deep gouges like nothing I'd ever seen from any animal I knew. I turned to leave when something rustled in the bushes upstream. I raised my rifle, eyes searching the undergrowth. That's when I saw it. A head, canine definitely, but too big for a wolf, with a longer snout. It had huge yellow eyes staring right at me. 
Its body stayed mostly in the shadows, but what I could make out was a mess of thick, dark fur, and it was big, standing as tall as me on two legs. I froze. Adrenaline hit me like a truck. The thing in the bushes let out a low growl, the kind that vibrates in your bones. Then in a flash, it launched out into the clearing, scrambling across the creek towards me on all fours. I finally snapped out of it, raising the rifle and firing a shot. It yelped and veered off, disappearing back into the bushes. I didn't stick around to see if I hit it. I took off running back down the trail, heart pounding in my ears. I must have looked like a crazy man bursting out of the woods, startling the folks still sitting by the trailhead. I never told anyone about what I saw up there. I mean, who would believe me? Some kind of giant wolf-dog creature? Hell, I barely believed it myself. But I filed a report with the ranger station anyway. Said I'd come across some poached animals and felt unsafe. Didn't mention the rest. The ranger looked at me funny. I think he suspected the story was more about booze than bears. A couple weeks later, I was in the local bar and some folks were talking about a string of missing hikers up in the range. Gave me chills. Suddenly my lone construction worker cabin didn't seem so appealing anymore. I put in my transfer shortly after, and left Wyoming behind. These days I live in a suburb, a good one with lots of streetlights and neighbors. Don't do much hiking anymore. Sometimes when I'm closing the blinds at night... I get that feeling again, like eyes are on me out in the dark. I tell myself it's just a memory, just me being nervous after what I saw. But part of me thinks that maybe it saw me too, maybe it knows where I went. I think about those bones by the creek, and the size of those teeth marks, and I hope I'm wrong. There's a reason some places stay wild. It's not just the bears you have to worry about. This happened to me a few years ago, not that I like to talk about it. I was working as a park ranger out in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful spot, or at least so I thought until all this happened. It was my job to check out all the trails, make sure everything was safe, do regular patrols, just routine stuff. Most days, it was pretty uneventful. Me and a couple of other rangers, Jasper and Ayana, were doing a perimeter check, which takes a few days as the park is huge. It's dense forest out there, you know? Old trees, deep ravines, the whole works. Not the easiest terrain to navigate. It was early fall, the leaves were starting to change, that kind of thing you might see in a postcard. Picture perfect, right? I should have known better. One afternoon, we were about halfway into day two of the perimeter check. We decided to camp off the trail, down an old overgrown logging road. I figured it would be clear enough to move through if any vehicles needed to get down there. Honestly, we weren't expecting anyone. Place is pretty remote. It was just after sundown, starting to get dark. We built a small campfire, nothing too big. I went to the creek to get water while Jasper and Ayana finished setting up camp. While I was filling the water jugs, I heard a rustling. It stopped as soon as it started. Figured it was a deer or something, so I didn't think much of it. Back at camp, Ayana had dinner almost ready. We ate, and by then, it was full-on dark. Jasper had the first watch, so Ayana and I settled into our tents for the night. I must have dozed off because the next thing I heard was Jasper yelling. I sat up, heart pounding, but I didn't move. Sometimes it was a bear getting into the trash. Whatever it was, I didn't want to draw attention to myself. Ayana! Jasper called again, 
voice sharp with fear. Still, I didn't move. Training, common sense, all that told me to stay put. But I was worried. There was another yell, more desperate, and then, nothing. Just the sound of the wind through the trees. Finally, I unzipped the tent and crept out. Jasper was nowhere to be seen. His flashlight lay on the ground, broken, the beam flickering. I found myself calling out softly, first for Jasper and then for Iana. No answer from either. The campfire was dying down to embers. I saw a dark shape sprawled out beside it. I went closer, stomach churning. I'll spare you the details, but there was no mistaking it or what had attacked her. Now, I don't scare easily. But that moment, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I knew enough about wild animals to know that whatever did this, it wasn't a bear, a cougar, or anything normal like that. My instincts told me one thing, run. I took what supplies I could grab quickly, left the rest, and headed deeper into the woods. My plan was simple yet dumb. Keep moving till dawn, then try to find a ranger station and get help. All night I hiked, not on any trail, just pushing through the underbrush. Every snap of a twig made me jump. I kept seeing shadows at the edge of my vision. I don't know how many times I tripped and fell. My clothes were torn, I was covered in scratches, but I didn't dare stop. Come sunrise, I was exhausted but still miles from anywhere. I found a stream to drink from and wash some of the grime off myself. My stomach was growling, but I didn't want to give away my position by starting a fire to cook. I was hunkering down, catching my breath, when I heard it again, the rustling. Only this time it was closer. Much closer. I froze, hardly even daring to breathe. There was a snort, a snarl, and something burst from the bushes. It stood on two legs, easily seven feet tall. Thick gray fur covered its powerful body, and its head, it looked like a wolf, but distorted somehow, elongated. Its eyes glowed a sickly yellow, and its teeth were long and sharp. It was all muscle and claws. I was so stunned. I didn't even get a chance to run. It leapt at me, knocking me flat. I tried to fight it off, kicking and punching, but it was too strong. It pinned me down, hot breath reeking of carrion in my face. I thought, this is it. This is how I die. I closed my eyes, waiting for the end. But it didn't come. Instead, there was a sound. Two sharp cracks gunshots. The creature snarled, its weight lifted off me. I opened my eyes, heart pounding, to see two blurry figures running towards me. My vision swam, and then everything went black. I woke up in the hospital bed. Turns out, a couple of hikers had been in the area and heard the shots. They'd found me unconscious by the creek, with fresh wounds. The creature was gone. They told me the police were there too, searching for Jasper and Iana. I described what attacked us, but the cops just exchanged looks. I could tell they didn't believe me. They wrote it off as an animal attack. I insisted, but they just patted me on the shoulder and told me I was lucky to be alive. The doctors gave me some pills for anxiety and pain, discharged me a few days later. I went back to Glacier, tried to pick up the pieces of my life. The official report said Jasper and Iano were missing, presumed dead. Animal attack, likely a bear. They never found their bodies. I was the only survivor, but no one believed my story. People started giving me strange looks, whispering behind my back. That ranger who went crazy, they'd say. I guess it's easier to believe a man is insane than to believe in monsters. Eventually, I quit my job. 
couldn't look at those woods without seeing the creature, hearing Iona's screams, remembering Jasper's broken flashlight. I moved to a city, far from any national parks. Took a desk job, keep my head down. It's a lonely existence. Sometimes I think I am losing my mind. Did I imagine it all? A trauma-induced hallucination? But then there are nights when I wake up drenched in sweat, hearing the rustle of leaves, the snarl in the darkness. And I know. I know that thing is still out there. It got my friends, but it didn't get me. Not yet. I know it's only a matter of time before it comes back. I just don't know how to prepare, how to fight back against something not even believed to be real. It's a tragic aftermath to an even more tragic event, and my only companion now is the crippling fear of a creature I may never see again, yet know is always lurking unseen. This happened to me a couple of years back. I was working as a mechanic, not glamorous, but it paid the bills. My one escape was fishing. Every weekend I could, I'd pack up my old truck and head to the lakes to find some peace and quiet. It's my thing. Helps me unwind after a long week, you know? My name's Wyatt, by the way. This particular weekend... I was heading way up north, to a remote spot in the Michigan Upper Peninsula. Dense forests, pristine lakes, hardly anyone out that way. The drive was most of the day, but I figured it'd be worth it. I even treated myself to a steak dinner at a roadside diner, something I don't normally splurge on. Got to the lake late at night. Found a flat spot near the shore threw my tent up in the moonlight. The night air had a bite to it, felt like fall was coming in quick. I got a fire going, cracked a cold beer, and just listened to the waves. Life was good. I woke at dawn, made some coffee, and set out to find the honey hole. There's this one cove, tucked way down the shoreline, that's a great spot for trout. Took me most of the morning to reach it, but that feeling when you cast a line in a place like that, worth the hike. I spent hours there. Few good bites, but nothing to show for it besides some pretty scenery. Around lunchtime, my stomach told me to find some real food. I headed back up the trail, figuring I'd eat right on the lakeshore. Coming over a ridge, I stopped dead in my tracks. A few hundred yards off, by the water, was an animal of some kind. I couldn't quite make it out, only the shape. But this, this thing was massive. My first thought was moose, but it moved wrong. It stood upright, walked on two legs like a person, only hunched over somehow. I ducked behind some brush, my heart pounding a mile a minute. It didn't seem to notice me, so I slowly lowered myself to the ground and started creeping away, keeping it in sight, just in case. When I was sure I was at a safe distance, I risked a glance back. Now that I had a better look, I had to blink a few times. The thing, it looked like a wolf, only twice as big, easily six feet tall even when hunched over. And its head, its face was longer, more pointed than a wolf's. Its fur was dark, matted, and it had thick, powerful forearms that looked like they could tear a man in two. Fear flooded through me like nothing I'd ever felt. It was staring right across the lake like it could sense me. I got to my feet and ran. Didn't stop running until I reached my truck, fumbling with the keys, my hands shaking too hard to work the damn thing. I practically threw my gear in the back and slammed the gas pedal. I didn't look in the rear view until miles were between me and that lake. When I finally did, I breathed a sigh of relief that no monstrous canine creature was loping after me. I was so shaken I almost called the cops. 
Didn't know what good it would do to say I'd seen Bigfoot's bigger, uglier cousin out there in the woods. So I drove home, tail between my legs, vowing to stick to the stock community ponds from here on out. Turns out, there are stories about something like what I saw. People call it a dogman. Most folks think it's just some weird internet myth. A campfire tale to scare the kids. Me? I don't know for sure. But I know what I saw. And I know that out there, in those wild places, some things walk that we aren't meant to see. This happened to me a few years ago. Not that I like to talk about it. I was working as a park ranger out in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful spot, or at least so I thought until all this happened. It was my job to check out all the trails, make sure everything was safe and maintained right. I was pretty close with some of the regulars, folks who would use the trails for hiking or trail running. We'd always chat and they'd let me know if they saw anything out of place. One day, old Marcus, must have been in his seventies but spry as a mountain goat, comes up to me after his morning run looking shaken. Hey, Finn, he says. I saw something messed up on the South Peak Trail. Something real bad. Now, Marcus wasn't one to exaggerate. He'd seen his share of bears and cougars on his runs and it never fazed him. So, I took him seriously. I asked him what he saw, thinking maybe he stumbled across some kind of animal attack. Can't really say, he admits. It was dark, still some fog clinging on. But there was fur, and claws, and something I can't rightly describe. It was too big, moving too fast. And, and there was something else on the trail. Marcus trails off, looking sick. I press him, trying to get a clearer picture of what had him so spooked. Blood, he finally forces out. A lot of it. Something got torn up bad out there. I thank Marcus and get my gear together. It's my job, so off I go down the South Peak Trail despite the prickling on the back of my neck. I walk carefully, keeping my eyes sharp rifle ready. The thing that starts to bother me is the silence. No birds, no squirrels, nothing. Usually, the air is full of sounds up in the mountains. It's kind of comforting. The silence is a bad sign. I get further down, and there's a sharp smell that hits me. Blood and something, off. Like rotting meat but sharper, more acrid. That's when I see it, not a carcass like I thought, but something dragged across the trail. A smear of blood and guts, leading off into the trees. My heart does a double beat. Whatever did this, it's big. Too big. I try to follow the trail. The trees make it hard, shadows everywhere. Then up ahead I catch movement. For a second, I think it's a black bear. Big, moving on all fours. But as it gets closer, the shape is wrong. Lanky, too tall on its back legs. The thing turns its head, sees me. The eyes, yellow and they glow in the shadow of the trees. Then it stands up, stands on its hind legs, and my mind blanks out. I've never seen anything that tall, at least seven feet if it's an inch, covered in dark matted fur. Its snout is all wrong, teeth too long for any animal I know. It looks at me, and for a second, I swear I see hunger, a kind of intelligence, in those glowing eyes. Without thinking, I raise my rifle and fire. The thing lets out a howl, a sound that makes the hair on my arms prickle. It's part animal, but also something else, a weird echo in it. I don't wait around to see if I hit it. I turn and run. I run faster than I've ever run in my life, branches tearing at my clothes, 
my breath sighing in and out of my lungs. Behind me, I hear it crashing through the trees, getting closer. I fire a few more shots over my shoulder, hoping to scare it off more than anything. I don't stop running until I break out of the trees, collapsing onto the main trail. After a while, I manage to catch my breath enough to radio for help. A few of the other rangers join up with me, and we cautiously head back to where I encountered the creature. There's no sign of it, but there's blood. Not a lot, so either I only grazed it or it's one tough beast. We didn't find any sign of whatever it had killed either. The thing vanished like a ghost. The other rangers looked at me like I was crazy when I tried to describe the, the thing that attacked me. I'm not crazy and I'm not a liar, but what else could I call it? Some of them muttered about, dogmen, sightings in the area. At the time, I thought that was ridiculous, just some internet campfire tale. We never found anything else. No body, no more sightings. I even went back later, with some buddies, hoping to find proof, but nothing. Some days I even convinced myself it was just a weird-looking bear, my mind playing tricks in the fog and the quiet. But some nights, when the wind howls the right way outside my cabin, I think I hear something echoing back. Something deep and guttural, and then those glowing eyes flash behind my eyelids, and I know the truth. I'm not being hunted anymore, at least not that I know of, but that doesn't mean it's not out there, biding its time. This happened to me a few years back when I was living in Idaho. I'm a carpenter by trade, always good work in those new housing developments popping up, you know? Back then, I was working out by Coeur d'Alene National Forest. It's rugged territory, beautiful, but rough if you don't know what you're doing. My crew had a contract building some fancy cabins near one of the lakes. We'd be out there for weeks on end only heading back to town for supplies. One afternoon, my buddy, Declan, and I are hauling lumber down this old logging trail. We needed to get these beams to the worksite before sundown. We're in his beat-up old truck, rattling along the uneven path, dust swirling around us. Now, Declan, he's the kind of guy who has a tall tale for every occasion. Always talking about Bigfoot sightings, lost treasure, that sort of thing. Entertaining, but I never took him too seriously. Halfway there, Declan slams on the brakes. Tires crunch in the dirt. Whoa! He exclaims. What in the... I follow his gaze, and there it is, clear as day, a pair of bloody handprints smeared across the dusty side of his truck. They're too big to be human, fingers too long and thick. We exchange a look, and even Declan's usual bravado seems to falter. Then the smell hits us. Like rotten meat mixed with something, musky. Declan starts the truck, his hands a little shaky on the wheel. Let's get the hell out of here, he mutters. We drive the rest of the way in tense silence the stink of whatever made those prints seeming to seep into the cab. At the work site, the other guys give us funny looks, we must reek. But nobody really questions us, they know the woods out there get strange. Still, we finish the job at a record pace. Sun dipping low, a sense of unease prickles along the back of my neck. It gets worse that night. I toss and turn in the little trailer we bunk in, feeling a prickling on my skin like unseen eyes are watching me. Declan doesn't sleep at all. He sits by the window, a rusty old shotgun he inherited from his grandpa cradled in his arms. You don't think? Nah, that's crazy, right? He doesn't finish the thought, but I know what he means. Probably just some mountain lion. I say... 
even though I doubt my own words. Suddenly a scream pierces the night. A horrible sound, human, but cut short. It comes from the direction of the lake. Stay here, Declan barks. He grabs that shotgun and runs out into the darkness. I sit there frozen. Not my fight, right? Should have stayed a city boy, where the worst you'll see is a raccoon with rabies. But something ugly twists in my gut. Five minutes stretch into an eternity, punctuated by the thud of a distant gunshot. Then, another scream, different this time. Not human, this one. It's a guttural howl, part pain, part rage. It echoes through the trees, raising goosebumps on my skin. Silence falls, and I strain my ears, waiting. Then come footsteps, soft in the dirt, moving toward the trailers. My heart thuds so loud I swear whatever's out there will hear it. Under the sliver of moonlight, I see a figure melt out from the tree line. It's massive, easily seven feet tall, hunched over on powerful legs. Covered in dark fur, its muzzle is long, its eyes gleaming yellow in the shadows. The beast pauses, head tilted as if sniffing the air. It sees me. All I can do is stare, frozen. It moves closer, and details solidify, ragged claws, teeth bared in an unsettling snarl. I try for a yell, but only a whimper escapes my throat. And then, Declan lurches from the darkness, his shotgun roars, sending a blast of fire into the night. It doesn't kill the creature, but it must hurt, because it lets out that same guttural howl and crashes back into the trees. Declan runs to the trailer, pale and shaking. Don't know what that thing is, but we're leaving. Right now. We pile everything we can into the truck and burn rubber, not stopping until we see the lights of Cur Delane in the distance. We never went back to that work site. Told the company there'd been a safety issue. Wasn't exactly a lie. After a few days in town, I start seeing news reports. Some hikers missing from the National Forest, bodies never found. Declan and I, we exchange a look. We don't say a thing, but we both know. Funny thing is, nobody believes us when we try and tell them what we saw. They figure some bear or cat got those folks, a freak accident. Maybe they're right. Maybe I just want them to be. Out there, in those dark Idaho woods, I know there's something else lurking, something that defies explanation. We got lucky that night. And yeah, since then, I've stuck to building houses where the worst threat is a rusty nail, not nightmares with claws and teeth. This happened to me a few years ago when I was working in Oregon. I'm a surveyor always been more comfortable in the open backcountry than some stuffy office. Back then, my job took me deep into the Willamette National Forest. Prime cougar and bear territory. But you learn to live with that kind of risk. This particular project had me and my partner, Kai, charting a route for a new logging road. Days spent bushwhacking, taking measurements, leaving bright orange markers, routine stuff. One day we're way out on the edge of the survey area. Kai is jotting notes in his pad and I'm calling out coordinates. Should get this part done before lunch. Suddenly, Kai makes a shushing motion, eyes flicking to some thick brush across a ravine. I freeze, my usual wise-ass remark dying on my lips. Something feels wrong. The air goes still, the usual forest chatter fading out. Then I see it, a flicker of something massive moving within the trees. For a second, I pass it off as a deer, but it's the wrong shape, too tall. I get a sinking feeling in my stomach. Cougar? I whisper to Kai. 
Even as I say it, I know it doesn't fit. His brow furrows, eyes darting. Maybe, he murmurs, let's back up slow, get to the truck. We inch backward, every rustle of leaves making my skin tingle. I risk a glance over my shoulder it's closer, a gaunt silhouette slipping between the pines. Then the stink hits me, a rotting meat smell that has nothing to do with a cougar. Now I'm spooked. We break into a stumbling run, me swearing at a root that nearly trips me. We're almost to the tree line, almost to the truck. That's when it steps out into the open. Not a cougar, not anything I've ever seen before. It stands on its hind legs, easily seven feet tall and lean, like a starved wolf. Its fur is ragged, its snout too long. Its eyes glint yellow, staring straight through us. For a long moment, we all just hang there, me and Kai, catching our breath, and the creature, watching. Gone! Kai hisses, scrambling to unholster the pistol he carries for predators. Before he can get a shot off, the thing drops down onto all fours with inhuman speed. It charges toward us, a guttural snarl ripping through the air. Run! Kai yells. We need no encouragement. Blind panic floods my system, shoving any rational thought aside. Kai's pistol roars as we race back toward the truck. The bullets must connect, because a howl splits the air, a mix of fury and pain. I barely register it my only focus is reaching the truck and the safety it represents. We stumble into the clearing. Kai slams the truck door just as the creature explodes from the tree line. It snarls again, slamming into the driver's side window. Glass shatters. I scream, recoiling. Kai throws the truck into gear, tires spinning in the dirt. We tear down the path the crashing of the beast against the truck fading behind us. We don't stop until we reach the main highway, hearts pounding. At first, all Kai and I can manage is shaking our heads and swearing under our breath. He calls in a report, describes a mangy dog attack, leaves out the really weird parts. Animal control sets some traps in the area, but they catch nothing. We go back once, a week later, armed with bigger guns. That chunk of forest is dead silent. All we find is the shattered truck window and some long gouges carved into the metal siding. I've read the dogman tales online, always thought they were exaggerated, some combo of bare sightings and campfire yarn. Now, I'm not so sure. I've spent my whole life in the woods, and I never saw anything like that. We got lucky, plain and simple. I'm still out there with my map and compass, but now I keep a closer eye on the shadows. And maybe, next time I'm buying something a bit stronger than a pistol. This happened to me a few years back when I was a smoke jumper working out in Montana. For folks who don't know, that means when those big forest fires break out, it's my job to parachute in and fight them head on. High risk stuff, but when you're young and full of yourself, it seems like the coolest job ever. I was part of a crew assigned to a blaze raging through the Bitterroot National Forest. Rugged, isolated country, this fire wasn't playing by the rules the wind kept shifting, making it unpredictable. A few nights in, my team ends up on the fire line after dark. Protocol says we'd hunker down till dawn, but this thing was bad, and we had orders to keep it from jumping a ridge. We're exhausted, chopping, digging, and dousing hot spots all day long. Everyone's quiet, focused. We move in two lines, working through an area of burned pines. Their blackened skeletons cast long, wavering shadows as our headlamps cut through the smoky air. 
Suddenly, Ezra, the guy ahead of me, lets out a startled curse. What is it? I call out, coming closer. He doesn't answer, just points into the trees. My headlamp beam follows his finger. There, half obscured by the gloom, is a body. At first glance, I think it's a fallen firefighter. Then I see its shape. Too long, too lean. And fur. The body is covered in ragged, dark fur. A chill runs down my spine. Some kind of animal caught in the fire? A bear, maybe? I get a few steps closer and a wave of nausea nearly doubles me over. The stink is unreal like charred meat and something fouler underneath. My voice comes out shaky. Ezra, call this in. He's frozen, staring at the body with wide eyes. I nudge him, and his radio crackles on the static sounds deafening against the oppressive silence. Then... Another sound cuts through the night a low growl that seems to vibrate right through the earth. I whirl around, heart pounding. Two glowing yellow eyes pierce the darkness. The eyes are set in a long, wolfish muzzle on a body poised low and powerful. Its size, the sheer wrongness of it my brain scrambles for comparison. A dog, maybe? But no dog stands easily seven feet at the shoulder. No dog moves with that unsettling mix of hunger and intelligence. Go! I shout to Ezra, and we both take off running. As we stumble back to the rest of the crew, the creature slips from the trees. It stands completely still in the glow of our lights, watching us, calculating. The rest of the night is a tense blur. We get on the radio, warn everyone in the area. Our team huddles together armed with shovels, flares, pathetic protection against the thing out there stalking us. The growls echo through the night, sometimes close, sometimes further off, but always there. Morning comes like a pardon. Helicopters swarm overhead, and the sight of the ground crews gives us enough courage to retreat. They never find a trace of that creature. Officially, the report goes down as an unknown animal attack on the firefighter whose body we found. He'd been mauled badly, though who or what finished him off remains a sick mystery. Me, well, I still take firefighting gigs, but not in the backcountry, not anymore. I learned something out there under those black pines. The woods hold things stranger and older than any fire, things human eyes aren't meant to see. Some folks I tell this story to, they chuckle, call it nerves and bad whiskey. They ask if I'm sure it wasn't a bear, one messed up from the fire. And yeah, maybe they're right. Maybe my mind, exhausted and on edge, played a hell of a trick on me. But that doubt, that prickle of unease, that never fades. Because what I saw out there, what stared back at me, that wasn't just an animal. This happened to me a few years ago, not that I like to talk about it. I was working as a park ranger out in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful spot, or at least so I thought until all this happened. It was my job to check out all the trails, make sure everything was safe and maintained right. I was pretty fit, in my mid-twenties then. Liked the solitary work and figured if I ever did bump into a bear well, that was part of the territory, right? Things started out simple enough. I was walking the South Loop Trail. It's a little less traveled than some of the others, and about halfway along it cuts through a denser part of the woods, old-growth trees, the thick canopy kind of thing. I'd heard some reports from hikers about a weird smell back in that area, figured it was a rotting animal. Nothing worth canceling my afternoon for. As I got deeper in, the smell definitely got worse. Not like rotting flesh, though. It was musky, almost a damp dog kind of smell, 
but ten times stronger. I was about to turn back when I heard a noise, a crack of a branch, just up the trail. My first thought was a deer. They spook easy. Hello? I called out, holding my hands up, ranger badge obvious. There was no answer. Just the sound of dripping water somewhere in the trees. I edged closer, the smell almost overpowering now. Then I saw movement off to my left a large shape slipping back into the undergrowth. My breath caught. Bear? Seemed too tall, too lean. But what else could it be? Come on out, I said again, my voice strained. I'm not here to bother you. The thing didn't move. But that smell. Suddenly, the dripping sound was right behind me. I spun. There was nothing. My heart hammered a mile a minute. Something was wrong. I could just feel it. Then I heard the snarl. Low, guttural, right in my ear. I whirled around again as something slammed into my shoulder, knocking me to the ground. I barely had time to think. There was a flash of movement before a massive weight landed on my chest, pinning me flat, breath forced from my lungs. The stench of the creature nearly made me gag. I caught a glimpse of dark, matted fur, and teeth, longer than a dog's, definitely not a bear. Through the pain, I saw something else. Eyes, glowing yellow in the gloom. Fear shot through me like a bolt of electricity. This wasn't natural, wasn't any kind of animal I knew. The weight shifted, and a rough paw clawed at my chest, tearing my shirt open. I screamed, thrashing around, kicking with all my strength. It didn't move the creature an inch. It snarled again, this time right in my face. My hand scrabbling on the loose dirt found a rock. Without thinking, I brought it up, smashing it into the thing's side as hard as I could. It gave a high-pitched yelp of surprise, the weight momentarily lessening. I kicked out, catching it right in the snout, and it finally lurched backwards. I scrambled to my feet, my heart in my throat. The creature crouched in the undergrowth, panting, those yellow eyes focused right on me. It couldn't have been more than seven feet tall when it stood on its hind legs, its fur thick and wiry like a wolf's. But the head, that was wrong. The muzzle was too long, the teeth like crooked fangs. I fumbled for my radio, my fingers clumsy with adrenaline. The creature watched me, head cocked to the side like it was curious. Then it took a step forward, and another. Go away! I yelled, desperation making my voice crack. Leave me alone! The creature growled, its lips curling back from its teeth. Another step. I tripped backwards, my radio slipping from my grasp. I hit a tree with a jolt, and suddenly there was nowhere to go. It was on me in a flash. I threw up my arms in a hopeless attempt at defense. Claws raked down tearing bloody gashes along my skin. I screamed again, kicking and punching, but it was no use. Its strength was unbelievable. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a blur of motion hikers emerging onto the trail just yards away. They froze, staring at the scene with wide eyes. Help! I choked out, flailing my arms. Help me! The creature froze too, turning its head to look at them. The hikers took off screaming, disappearing back down the path. The creature looked back at me, snarl morphing into a twisted grin. Then it was gone. It vanished into the dark trees, taking the stench with it, leaving me slumped against the trunk, bleeding and shaking. I don't remember much after that. Rescue came. The story spread like wildfire. I heard whispers about a crazy ranger, some chemical spill cover-up, and of course, the classic Bigfoot tale. I told them what I saw, 
but nobody ever believed me. They said it must have been a bear attack, maybe a mountain lion. They told me I was lucky to be alive. I don't argue anymore. Whatever that thing in the woods was, well, I lived to tell the tale, which is more than I can say for some others who've gone missing in those parts. This happened to me a couple of years back. I was living down in the Florida Panhandle at the time, working at a marina, doing boat maintenance. Nothing fancy, but it paid the bills, and being right on the water suited me just fine. One afternoon late in the summer, my buddy Randall and I decided to check out this little island a few miles down the coast. Word was fishing was good out there, and with a lull in work, we figured, why not? Randall, he's an old salt. Been fishing and boating since he could walk, and knows all the local waters like the back of his hand. This island, though, wasn't really a proper island. More like a big sand spit, one of the many that crop up along that coast. Gets cut off at high tide, a few scattered trees, and not much else. But we weren't picky. Sun, rods, and beers sounded like heaven after a couple weeks hauling engines around. We get out there, and man, Randall wasn't kidding. The fish were practically jumping onto our lines. That's how it goes, right? You hear it's biting, race out there, and then the fish suddenly remember they've got other stuff to do. Not today. We must have been pulling M and two at a time for what felt like hours. We got into a real rhythm, tossing lines, cracking open fresh beers, and talking that kind of nonsense only buddies do when they finally have a minute to cut loose. The sun was dipping low now, casting long shadows along the sand. That's when I saw the first sign something was off. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed one of the empty beer cans move. Kicked up a little spurt of sand like something bumped it. I chalked it up to a crab or some skittering beach critter. But then, another one rolled. Randall, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. You seeing that? He frowned, peering at the cans. See what, exactly? Tide coming in early, maybe? I shook my head. Cans. They're moving. Nah, he laughed. You've had too many of those yourself. And then we both saw it. One of the cans, it straight up lifted off the ground, like an invisible hand plucked it, then tossed it a few feet sideways. I swear, the beer almost sloshed out. Now Randall was staring at me with those wide fisherman eyes of his. We didn't say a word. Just reeled in our lines, grabbed our stuff, and started hauling back toward the boat. Didn't even look back at the scattering cans. Whatever was out there, messing with our empties, we didn't want anything to do with it. Made it to the boat, shoved off from the bank fast as we could. I turned to look back once we were out of safe ways. The trees on that sandbar were getting dark, hard to see. Then I saw it, a tall, lanky shape, darker than the shadows, detaching from the edge of the tree line. It looked almost canine, standing upright on two legs. Jesus, Randall breathed, staring wide-eyed. Let's just go. I didn't need telling twice. We gunned that little outboard motor, and we didn't look back until we hit the mainland and the sun had vanished entirely. Over the next couple weeks, I kept an ear out, scanning the local papers, online news, anything that might hint at some animal attack or something weird gone down out near that island. Nothing. We'd figured maybe a coyote had gotten stranded, maybe even a sick panther, something out of its element, and messing with our trash. Here's the thing, though. I swear that shape I saw wasn't any coyote or mountain lion. Too tall, too skinny, and the head all wrong. 
Randall swore up and down that he saw it too, but we agreed. We weren't telling a soul about our little fishing trip. People hear a story like that, you get laughed at, or worse, folks start thinking you're seeing things. That was as close as I ever wanted to get to, whatever it was. Sometimes I search online, you know, looking up cryptid sightings down that way. Find a story or two that sends a shiver down my spine. Mostly folks seeing something tall and dog-looking lurking in the shadows. They think I'm crazy, and honestly, some days I think they're right. But I know what I saw, Randall knows what he saw, and that island, well, it stays empty as far as I'm concerned. This happened to me a few years back, just outside of Flagstaff in Arizona. I'm a bit of a nature buff, a hiker, always down for trails I haven't tackled before. So, when my buddy, Orson, asked if I was game for some off-grid trails, I didn't even bat an eyelash. I'm Jason, by the way. Flagstaff, that whole area is gorgeous. Ponderosa pines everywhere that dry, crisp air, the feeling of being on top of the world. Trails out there? Forget manicured paths. It's rocks and exposed roots, the way nature intended. We packed up light, couple of protein bars, water, the usual. Orson had done the trail before, said it wasn't too steep until the final push, but absolutely worth the view. Now, this part, it's different every time I tell it. Sometimes the thing that gets us off the trails it's a bird call. Sometimes it's just wanting to explore that one bend. But that day, I saw this glint, like a lost quarter catching the sun. It was off-path, a good stretch through the trees. Orson wasn't having it. Dude, stick to the trail. It's getting late but I was already heading towards the shine. It wasn't a quarter, though. It was a bone. Big, too big for a deer. The shape was all wrong. It had this weird, knobby bulge at one end, and it was so clean. Like an animal hadn't gnawed at it, more like it had just fallen off. I should have left it right there. Curiosity didn't kill the cat, it damn near killed this fool is more like it. Before I knew it, I was pocketing the bone and heading deeper into the trees. Orson grumbled behind me, but he followed. City slicker can't stand being alone. The trail was long gone now, which was kind of exhilarating, actually. Real into the wilderness stuff. It's funny, you never realize how loud the woods are until things go quiet. Like an actual hush fell. No birds, no wind sighing. Just the crunch of our boots and that unsettling silence. Then, a crack. Like someone breaking a big branch, but dry. Orson froze. I did too, some animal instinct taking over. We gotta go, he whispered. I could barely hear him over my own heart pounding. I don't know why, maybe that damn bone was jinxed, but right then I tripped. Full face plant over a root. As I scrambled up, I saw it. Not ten yards away, in a patch of sunlight, was a clearing. There was something there. It was tall, lean, but hunched over like its shoulders weighed it down. The thing, it was pale like sick pale. Mangy fur hung off it in patches, like a dog with bad hair loss. It was crouched over, and here's the kicker, gnawing on a leg. A human leg. From the hiking boot I could tell. Bone white picked clean. It heard me move. It snapped up, eyes black as marbles, a long muzzle filled with way too many teeth. I don't even remember screaming, more like this choked gasp. Orson shoved me and ran. And damn it, I ran too. 
That thing was fast. We hurtled rocks, ducked under branches, thorns tearing at us. Its snarl. I can't even describe it. A snarl shouldn't sound that deep, that human. We lost it near the main trail, thank God. Collapsing by a signpost, I remember looking up and seeing other hikers strolling merrily along. Normal. Like nothing was wrong, like we hadn't just gotten chased by some horror movie reject. We went to the rangers, told them some half-baked story about getting lost. They looked at us like we were idiots, but who cares? The important part is, we were alive. Orson quit hiking after that. Says I owe him a new hobby, but I can't blame the guy. Me, I hike the same trails I always have, well-populated ones, in broad daylight. That bone? Don't know what happened to it. Probably lost it in the scramble. Sometimes, when it's really quiet, I think I hear a snarl. But it's got to be my imagination, right? Nobody would believe that story in a million years. This happened to me a few years back, right outside of Missoula, Montana. I'm the outdoors type, you know? Hunting, fishing, a bit of a survivalist at heart. Always ready for anything. Names Everett, Everett Klein. Missoula, Rio Rugged. We're talking dense forests, mountain ranges, everything that makes Montana wild. This particular trip, it wasn't just me. I was showing my buddy, Nolan, the ropes. City kid through and through. He wanted the full untamed wilderness experience, and I figured, why not? He could use a little dirt under his fingernails. We were off a backcountry trail, no marked pads, using a GPS to get us to an old fishing spot. Nolan was complaining the whole time. Bugs, blisters, you name it. I chuckled, handed him some bug spray and pushed on. Now, here's the weird part. Every now and then, I'd catch this smell. Like wet dog, but stronger, a bit rotten. Thought maybe it was roadkill hidden by the trees. I didn't say anything to Nolan, didn't want to spook him out even more than he already was. We reached the clearing near dusk. The lake was small, but crystal clear, promising a good haul of trout. I cast my line, settling in, that's when I saw it, a flash of movement just beyond the tree lean. My pulse quickened, not with fear, but with that hunter's sense. A big buck, maybe? Nolan, oblivious, was busy swatting mosquitoes. Dude, I whispered, stay still. Something's out there. He froze, eyes wide. Then a branch snapped. Loud, right behind me. Instinct took hold. I grabbed Nolan's arm and bolted, ignoring our fishing gear and any semblance of stealth. It was on us fast. Too fast for a deer or even a bear. Glimpses through the trees showed it. Huge, lean, upright like a man, but not... For matted and patchy, a long muzzle, teeth bared in an inhuman snarl. What the hell is that? Nolan squeaked. I don't know, but run! I shouted back, my focus on not tripping and breaking our necks. Its breathing was guttural, a ragged rasp that echoed through the woods. Every time I thought it had given up, the sound would start again, closer. We ran for what felt like hours, finally reaching a stream. Too shallow for whatever was chasing us, I hoped. Crouched behind a boulder, we tried to catch our breath. Nolan was sobbing, tears streaming down his face. I felt a surge of guilt, then hardened my resolve. Come on, we gotta keep moving. It'll pick up our trail again. The hike back was a nightmare of whispers and shadows. That stink of wet dog, 
that snarling, it never really left us. Every time a twig snapped, Nolan flinched, eyes wide with a fear I understood now. We hit the main trailhead at dawn, stumbling into the parking lot and startling a group of early morning hikers. The ranger station was closed, but thank God for cell service. We called the sheriff, babbling about a monster, the wilderness, teeth, probably sounded like a couple of lunatics. The sheriff arrived, a heavy-set woman with a look that said she'd seen it all. We told our story, expecting disbelief. Instead, she got serious, nodded at some spots of blood near the trail and said, You boys are lucky. We've had reports of things out here. Don't go off trail again, you understand? Nolan hasn't touched a hiking pole since. Calls me a liar when I tell others the story. Part of me wishes I could write it off as a hallucination, a bad trip. But I know what I saw. I know I heard those snarls, felt that thing breathing down my neck. And I know, even in teeming cities with thousands around, I'll never feel truly safe again. The wild? It's not always as empty as you think. This happened to me a few years back. I'm still trying to understand it, still struggling to make sense of what I saw. See, I'm a hiker, the kind that craves long expeditions on remote trails. That should tell you something about me. I don't scare easily. I've dealt with wildlife, gotten myself lost, handled it all. But this, this was entirely different. It began in Sequoia National Park. You've probably heard of it, that place with the giant trees. I had a permit for an extended backcountry trek. The route was barely used snaking along ridges and through ravines deep in the southern part of the park. I craved the isolation. Maybe that's what makes me a fool in hindsight. It was supposed to be ten days, and I felt the usual thrill that first morning, the pack on my back, the wilderness waiting. The first few days went smooth as silk. Weather was perfect, scenery beyond belief. It was quiet, so quiet you could hear a pin drop, or so I thought. That fourth night is when things shifted. I heard it, at first too subtle to pinpoint. A rustle, a heavy footstep, something out there in the vast darkness. I dismissed it, must have been a deer or a bear. I secured my food, stoked the fire, and tried to sleep. But the sounds kept coming. The following morning, I found tracks, and they weren't from anything I could identify. Too large for a bear or mountain lion, vaguely human but misshapen. A chill went down my spine. Someone else was out there, but whoever it was didn't want to be seen, and something told me they weren't exactly friendly. I made the decision to cut my trip short. The smart thing, right? Get out while I still had a chance. Stupid pride, that's what decided otherwise. I pushed on, but my pace quickened. I started seeing things in the shadows, hearing whispers in the trees. My mind was playing tricks, pure and simple. I knew it. Only, I didn't entirely believe it. By the sixth day, I was on edge and exhausted. It felt like eyes were on me at all times. Then came the worst part, the smell. Like rotting meat and something musky I couldn't place. That's when I knew I wasn't alone. And worse, I knew it wasn't human. I ran. Blindly. I must have covered miles without realizing it. That evening, I chanced upon a ranger cabin tucked into the woods, abandoned for the season. My heart leapt. Shelter, maybe a phone. I burst through the door and slammed it shut behind me. There was silence. 
a single room musty untouched. My relief was short-lived. Outside the window, something huge moved slowly past. My blood ran cold. It wasn't just the creature's size, though it stood a good seven feet tall at the shoulder, moving hunched. It was the unnaturalness of it for, matted and dark, limbs long and impossibly bent, a muzzle too wide for anything I'd ever known. It had eyes, though. They locked onto mine for a long moment, glowing amber in the dusk. Then it vanished into the trees. That night was a blur. Barricading the door was pointless. I knew that. The walls felt flimsy. Sleep was impossible. Every creak, every snap of a twig, was it coming closer? Morning came at last, and my one thought was escape. I didn't care about gear or supplies anymore. I broke through the tree lean and ran. It was behind me. I could feel it. Not a proper chase, just biding its time. The trees thinned out. A meadow lay ahead, a road beyond it. Salvation. I was halfway across the clearing when I heard it, the scream. A woman's voice, cut off abruptly. It came from the same woods I'd fled. I froze. Something exploded from the tree line, and the woman ran into view, two hikers a step behind her. All three looked terrified, shouting incoherently. It was then I saw it properly. The creature loped on all fours, gaining on them at an impossible speed. Its face was locked in a grotesque grin, fangs bared. I didn't think. I just ran back toward the tree lean, yelled as loud as I could. The creature hesitated, swiveling its head, those damnable eyes finding me once again. The hikers got their head start. They vanished into the woods, screaming. I never saw any of them again. The creature watched for a long moment, then turned back to the woods. After an eternity, it disappeared amongst the trees. I stumbled out of the woods the following day, half delirious. Told the park rangers some story about a wild animal. They didn't believe me, of course. Nobody would. Years have gone by, and I still see its face, the twisted blend of dog and something far more sinister. Sometimes, I almost think I imagined it all. But then I remember the smell, the screams, and the knowledge that there are things out there far older and darker than we understand. This happened to me a few years back, out in the Ozarks. See, I'm a city guy, always have been. Got a good job, an apartment, all the usual nonsense. But a few times a year, I disappear. Not the usual vacation. I drive deep, find some off-grid cabin rental, and spend a week just unplugging. Sometimes it's hiking, sometimes just reading on the porch. My kind of reset, I guess. Stupid in hindsight, right? Being alone out in the middle of nowhere. This particular trip, I'd found a place in the Mark Twain National Forest, Rio backwoods of Missouri. Cabin was a converted fire tower, had this incredible 360-degree view. Got settled in, the sun was setting, the view was pure magic. The feeling wasn't. There was a tension hanging heavy in the air, a sense I wasn't alone. I told myself that was nonsense just nerves. Yet, the feeling didn't fade. Next morning, I decide to do a day hike, stretch the legs. There's a trail winding through the hills behind the cabin. I set off, and that's when I started noticing the signs. Rip branches, bits of fur, and a peculiar smell like, well, like a zoo enclosure gone wrong. I was on alert, scanning my surroundings like a madman. I didn't see anything, but the feeling of being watched only grew worse. 
I reached the peak just as the sun started dipping below the horizon. Something moved down in the valley below. I froze. First, I thought it was a bear, dark against the fading light. But this thing moved wrong. It was big, upright for a split second, then down on all fours like a huge dog. My heart hammered in my chest. This was no bear. The creature didn't notice me. I edged back and bolted down the trail. Something like a growl echoed behind me, sending chills down my spine. I ran until my legs burned, then stumbled right into an old shed, collapsing onto the dirt floor. I lay there till dawn, hardly daring to breathe. When morning finally broke, I made a run for my vehicle. Didn't stop till I was back in civilization. A few days later, I couldn't resist the urge. I looked into missing person cases in that area. Turns out, several solo hikers had vanished around the time I was there. I tried telling myself they got lost, that there was a logical explanation. But I knew it was a lie. I also knew exactly what I'd seen. Words started getting out. Whispers on some outdoors of forums, then an article in a local paper. They'd found a body, torn to shreds. Never identified the victim, never figured out what did it. But the description matched exactly what I'd seen. That huge, misshapen canine shape, too smart for a bear. Locals were muttering about the Ozark Collar, some old folktale about a wolf-like creature that haunted the hills. I didn't give it much thought then. Figured it was local legend to explain the inexplicable. But a few months later, it found me. Back home. My apartment's on the tenth floor. Imagine my surprise when I woke up one night, and those glowing eyes were staring back at me from the balcony. I haven't spent a night alone since. This happened to me a few years ago. I didn't like to leave my house. Now I'm more open to hiking or spending time in nature. If you ask, I'll talk about it. My name is Killian. Before all this happened, I always loved the peace of the forest. On weekends, I left behind the busy city for the solitude of the woods near my home. Just south of Asheville, a sprawling network of trails weaves through the North Carolina mountains. One crisp fall morning, I set off alone. The early sun barely poked through the heavy canopy of leaves. My hiking boots crunched over fallen twigs. I breathed deeply, savoring the scent of the damp earth beneath my feet. Every so often, I paused to watch the play of sunlight through the branches overhead. The woods were my sanctuary. Or so I thought. I came to a familiar clearing. A single massive oak dominated the space, its gnarled roots poking through the earth like fingers grasping at the sky. I always took a moment here before continuing on the trail. Something was different. Silence. It wasn't the comforting silence of the forest, but a thick, oppressive hush. The birds had fallen quiet. Even the gentle rustling of leaves in the wind had ceased. I felt uneasy, the hair on the back of my neck prickling. Then I heard it. A low growl, echoing from the trees beyond the clearing. My heart pounded in my chest. I froze. My mind raced, trying to pinpoint the source of the sound. A bear? I'd seen them around here before but never this close to the main trails. Another growl, louder this time. It didn't sound quite like a bear. Deeper, more guttural. It was definitely close now. I whirled, scanning the dense underbrush. My hands shook as I fumbled for my pocket knife, the small blade utterly useless against whatever creature lurked in the shadows. It stepped into the sunlight from behind a thick stand of pines. 
I had never seen anything like it. Taller than a man by far, it moved on two legs. Long, powerful arms hung at its sides, ending in huge clawed hands. It was covered in thick, matted fur, dark gray-brown. Its eyes burned into me from the depths of a long muzzle filled with sharp, yellow teeth. The creature was all muscle. There was no doubt it was a predator. I had heard the stories, of course. Tales of upright, wolf-like creatures lurking in the deepest woods went around these parts. I'd dismiss them as tall tales, stories to spook kids around the campfire. But now I knew those tales were rooted in something far more terrifying. Every instinct screamed at me to run, but my legs refused to move. I was rooted to the spot, fear keeping me paralyzed. The creature took a tentative step towards me, its head cocked to one side as it studied me. I saw intelligence in those eyes, a cold calculation that made my blood run cold. It lunged. I barely had time to react before its sharp claws were raking down my chest, tearing into the fabric of my jacket. Pain erupted in my torso and I stumbled back, gasping for breath. The creature howled in frustration, its eyes burning with bloodlust. My fear dissolved into desperate resolve. I couldn't stay here. I had to run. Blindly, I turned and bolted for the trees. I didn't look back. I sprinted through the woods, branches whipping at my face, my ragged breath burning in my lungs. Every sound of snapping twigs or rustling leaves made me jump in terror, certain that any moment the creature would be upon me. I ran until my legs could carry me no longer. I collapsed behind a fallen log, panting and shaking. For a long while, I didn't move. All I could do was listen intently, my entire body poised for flight. Slowly, I realized the sounds of the forest had returned. The wind rustled through the trees. Birds sang their songs once more. Still, I waited and waited. I rose cautiously, my body aching with scrapes and bruises. I crept back towards the clearing where my ordeal had begun. My hiking pack was strewn about, its contents scattered across the forest floor. The creature was nowhere in sight. Relief and fear warred within me. I knew I was lucky. I'd escaped with nothing more than some scratches and a story that nobody would likely believe. I never saw the creature again. I still hike those trails, but I do so with a wary eye and a faster pace. It's hard to fully return to that feeling of tranquility in the woods. The knowledge that something lurks there always lingers around the edges of my mind. This happened to me a couple of years back. I was pretty private back then, didn't spend much time outdoors, but now it's different. You'll hear why. My name's Elian. I've lived near the Olympic National Forest all my life, but before this whole thing, I'd only been on its trails a few times. The deep woods weren't my thing. That summer, though, I thought it'd be good to break out of my shell, you know, get some fresh air. I headed out early one morning. The trail was empty, just the way I liked it. Sun filtered through the trees overhead, birds chirped. Peaceful. My thoughts started to drift, the kind of mindless wandering you only get in nature. Then I saw it. Bones. Scattered across the path just ahead. At first, I figured it was a deer carcass, scavengers picking it clean. But as I got closer, something seemed wrong. The shape of the skull didn't fit. It was too long, the jaw too big. And the scattering of bones, too wide a spread. I stopped in my tracks. That was when I heard it, the snapping of branches from deeper in the trees. My pulse quickened. 
I called out, thinking it was some other hiker screwing with me. No answer. The cracking noise came again, closer this time. I backed away, keeping my eyes on the trees. It was definitely big, whatever it was. Bear crossed my mind, but something about the way it moved, the quietness, I didn't think so. Then it stepped out from the shadows. A nightmare made real. At least seven feet tall it stood, covered in thick, matted fur. Its face was a wolf stretched out long, full of yellow fangs. But it stood on two legs, built like a man, only much bigger, thicker with muscles. It studied me, yellow eyes narrowed in calculation. My mind froze. All those whispers of sightings, folklore I thought was nonsense, now they screamed in my head. There was a word for this thing, a word I never wanted to believe in. Dogman. It took a step towards me. I bolted. It was so much faster, easily clearing the undergrowth that tangled my feet. I could hear it gaining on me, its ragged breathing a monstrous drumbeat in my ears. Blind panic propelled me forward. I stumbled and fell, tumbling down a slope. Pain bloomed in my side as I slammed into a tree trunk. I thought it was over, that beast looming above me, but then I heard screams. A group of hikers further down the trail. The creature hesitated. It turned its head towards them, then melted back into the trees with shocking speed. Adrenaline fueled me, and I scrambled back to the trail and towards the sound of the screams. The hikers were a terrified mess. They'd seen the creature tear apart one of their friends, a blur of fur and claws in the brush. I did what anyone would. I called the park rangers, I told the police everything. They didn't find anything out there, of course. No creature, no remains of the poor hiker. The report went down as an animal attack, some unknown predator probably. In the town, though, the folks who believe in such things knew better. They saw it in my eyes. I didn't talk much about it after, just kept to myself. But it changed me. I hike those trails all the time now, armed to the teeth. Keep my head on a swivel, alert for any sound, any movement that's off. I've never seen that creature again, but I know it's out there. I'm always ready. The forest was my escape, now it's my battlefield. I'll never let my guard down. The price of forgetting is too high. This happened to me when I was working in Wyoming. Wolfields, not the most glamorous job, but it paid well enough until I figured out what the hell I was doing with my life. Name's Riker, by the way. Back then, I was young, restless, and just drifted from one paycheck to the next. The crews were rough and tumble, guys with plenty of demons, and a six-pack was how we dealt with them. My crew was assigned to a site near Medicine Bound National Forest sprawling pine woods cut through by dirt tracks and dotted with lonely drilling rigs. We set up our camp, metal trailers, a canteen, the whole deal. I'd heard whispers from the locals about the forest, hunters disappearing, old native legends, that sort of stuff. Back then I paid it no mind, just figured it was small-town spooks for idle minds. Should have listened, but hey, we all make mistakes. Things started wrong almost from the start. Tools going missing overnight, glimpses of a big shadow flickering at the edge of the site, that low guttural growl that echoed just below the level of normal hearing. One guy, we'll call him Zeke, swore he saw something huge and dog-like lurking at the tree lean one night. We laughed it off, blamed it on cheap whiskey and too many hours under the harsh Wyoming sun. It wasn't until Tom vanished that we started taking it seriously. Tom was solid, 
one of the older fellas on our crew, the kind who grumbled but always got the job done. He went out one morning to check on a pump and never came back. At first, we thought it was an accident, but as we searched, it got more unsettling. No blood, no sign of a struggle, and zero trace of Tom after we fanned out across the woods. That night, camp was tense. We kept rifles close, and the foreman doubled the watch shifts. Just before dawn, we heard it a volley of gunfire, screams cutting through, then silence. Two other guys were gone. Whatever was in the woods, it was hunting us. The rest is a blur. Panic set and we packed whatever we could carry the next morning and started hiking towards the highway. We stuck to the open spaces, keeping a lookout, expecting every rustle of leaves to turn into an attack. It never came. We reached a state trooper on the truck radio, got evacuated, and told the cops some cooked-up story about a bear going rouge, anything believable with just enough truth woven in to cover our asses. It wasn't until later, holed up in a seedy motel in some no-name town, that I saw the footprints. I was cleaning mud off my boots, saw the size of them, and remembered the other tracks I'd glimpsed near the camp. Way too big for a bear, too many toes to be a mountain lion, and something about the way they sunk into the earth gave me the chills. Upright, bipedal steps, like a man's, only monstrously huge. The news reports were vague, search and rescue finding nothing, some nonsense about animal attacks, the locals quietly spreading their own theories that none of us wanted to acknowledge. We got our severance package, a company memo to shut the hell up, and were kicked back out into the world. I don't tell folks this story often. They don't believe it, and honestly, some days neither do I but that primal fear never goes away. I spent the next few years bouncing from rig to rig, always keeping an eye on the edges of the job site, sleeping with a shotgun tucked under the bunk, just in case. One night, driving a lonely stretch of highway in New Mexico, I glimpsed a massive shape loping across the road. It moved with a weird, uneven gait, gone in a split second but burned into my memory. The fur, glistening in the headlights, was long and matted, and those eyes, those yellow, damn eyes. I didn't stick around to check. Just floored the gas pedal and drove until I saw lights of some two-bit town. Even city life hasn't been too bad after that. At least if something lurks in the shadows out here, it's the two-legged kind, and that I can handle. Or so I tell myself. Most nights I sleep all right, but sometimes I still wake up in a sweat, hearing the snap of branches, the guttural growl, and the screams of men vanishing into the trees. See, the thing is, you can run from whatever's in those woods, but you can't run from the realization that out there, far from the well-lit paths and GPS pins, there are things we weren't meant to understand, things that remind us that even with our rigs and rifles— we're still tiny, vulnerable creatures in a world far bigger and wilder than ourselves.